Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome along to this afternoon's planning board meeting. I'm Councillor Kelsey. I'm the chairman of this panel this afternoon. Um, the first thing I would do is pass to Democratic Services to read out the housekeeping notice regarding how this meeting will be managed. Mr Tyler. Thank you, Chair. Please note that this meeting of the planning committee is being recorded by the Council for live broadcast and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. Please could everyone present follow these ground rules. Only speak when invited to by the Chairman. Please use the microphones on your desk when speaking and please remember to turn them off when you are finished. If accessing the meeting via Microsoft Teams, please turn on your video function when invited to speak. Again, if you are accessing via Teams and would like to speak on an item, please do so by using the raise your hand feature in the bar at the top of the Teams window. For voting, the chairman will call out each committee member's name in roll call style and will ask the member to respond with a vote for, against or abstain. For those in the room, if the fire alarm sounds, please exit the building by way of the nearest available sign fire exit route and make your way to the ground floor of the multi-storey car park. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and that mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the duration of the meeting. And this includes members' laptops. Please make sure the volume on your laptops is turned down fully. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. I will now ask each member of the panel to introduce themselves, starting with myself. I'm Councillor Kelsey. I represent East Cliff and Springbourne Ward. Um, Councillor Tony Johnson, Vice Chairman. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Toby Johnson, Alderney and Bourne Valley Ward and Vice Chair Plan. Thank you. Councillor Steve Barron. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Steve Barron, Ward Councillor for Parkstone. And Councillor Stephen Bartlett. Yeah, good afternoon, Chair. Uh, Steve Bartlett, uh, member for Redhill and Northbourne Ward. Thank you. Councillor Simon Bull. Good afternoon, Chair. Simon Bull, Councillor for Winton East Ward. Councillor Malcolm Davies. Good afternoon, Chair. Could you use your microphone, please, Councillor Davies? Uh, Councillor Malcolm Davies, yeah. East Southbourne and Tapton. Turn the camera off from your laptop. Well, that one. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Councillor George Farquhar. Councillor George Farquhar, proud to represent Boscombe East and Pokestown. Councillor Peter Hall. Peter Hall for Christchurch Town Centre. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Paul Hilliard, Maddyford, Stampit and West Highcliffe. Councillor Marion Lepedevin. Councillor for Newtown and Heatherlands. Councillor Tony O'Neill, not present at this time. Councillor Beverly Dunlop, who is substituting for Councillor Anne Stribley. Councillor Beverly Dunlop, more down. And Councillor Derek Borswick, who is substituting for Councillor Brian Dion. Could you introduce yourself, please, Councillor Borswick? Yes, sir. Use your microphone, please. Turn your microphone off, yeah. No, the microphone on your desk, Councillor Borswick. Yeah. You need to introduce yourself. Oh, Councillor Derek Borswick. Thank you. And we have several officers with us this afternoon. Uh, Mr Hodges. Thank you, Chairman. David Hodges, Team Leader, Development Management. Uh, we have Mr Raven, we have Monica, we have Dominica, we have Kate Lasham, we have Mr Firth, and we have Joe Tyler, who is the Democratic Services Officers. Plus, in addition, there are other officers from Democratic Services providing background service for us to help run this meeting properly, and we thank them for doing so. We'll now move on to the agenda items for this meeting. The first item being apologies. Do we have any apologies, please, Mr. Hubbard? Thank you, Chairman. Um, yes, we have received apologies from Councillors Anne Stribley, Brian Dion, Norman Decent, and Simon McCormack. And subsequently, with item two, substitute members, we have with us today Councillor Beverly Dunlop substituting for Councillor Anne Stribley and Councillor Derek Borthwick substituting for Councillor Brian Dion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr Tyler. And do we have any declarations from interest on any of this afternoon's items, please, from any members? Councillor Bartlett. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, with regard to uh, 19 Kingswell Road, Bournemouth, uh, I live very near this property. Uh, and therefore, I won't be taking part in that debate. Thank you. Although I will stay in the room and listen, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Thank you for that, Councillor Bartlett. And item four is confirmation of minutes. Do the members agree to for me to sign the minutes for the previous meeting? 
Thank you. And item five is the protocol for public statements and planning committee. Could I, Mr. Tyler, do you have that handy? Because you had sent a rewrite, but I haven't printed it out. If you could read that for me, please. Uh, yes, certainly. So, um, the committee, you're being asked to delegate authority to the head of planning in consultation with the chair and vice chair of the planning committee to agree a revised protocol for public statements at planning committee. Uh, this protocol requires updating to appropriately and effectively allow public participation at meetings in line with any and all future changes in the COVID restrictions. And uh, Chair, if you don't mind, I, I would invite uh, our legal officer, Mr. Robert Firth, to comment if, if he wishes to at this stage. Thank Please you. Please do. Mr. Firth, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, as members will be aware, uh, we still are in a position of uncertainty regarding the position as far as social distancing is concerned. Uh, the government's extended time period on restrictions that currently but we don't know what's going to happen. Um, members will also be aware that we've already gone through one iteration of the uh, protocol to try and address the current situation that we're in. Going forward, if um, the, current, uh, the government chooses to uh, remove the restrictions that currently apply, we anticipate that members will be looking to move more towards an opportunity for the public to turn up and speak at committee. What we therefore need to do is bring in place a revised protocol to be able to facilitate that. However, as officers, we're conscious of the fact that we're still in a position where the situation is still unknown and may well change going forward. We don't know when the government's going to lift its current restrictions. We don't know if it's going to lift them in their entirety or in part. And of course, we don't know going forward if they might reimpose some restrictions. So what we're hoping to do is to come up with a protocol that will both a facilitate the opportunity for public speaking at committee in person when that's appropriate, but equally so enable us to change between different uh, protocols depending on the situation as it exists. We need to do that fairly quickly, Chairman, and that's why we're seeking a delegation in consultation with both yourself and the chair uh, and vice chairman at this time. Um, of course, there's nothing to stop once that's delegated members revising and revisiting the protocol at a future date should they wish to do so. Thank you, Mr. First. So, members, are you happy to go forward with that? We can talk about this later. There is a draft policy coming through at this moment in time, which we can discuss after the after we've done the um, applications this afternoon, if that's OK with everyone. Yeah, everyone happy with that? OK, thank you. So public issues. Um, after each presentation from the officer on each individual application, I will refer to Mr. Tyler to read out any written statements before we hear from any ward councillors who wish to speak. So moving on to the schedule of planning applications, before we do that, I would like to ask for the committee to see what their view is. Item 7D was a call in from Councillor Anderson. It only had one representation from a resident and the only reason it was here at the board is because it was a call in. The resident has now agreed with the amendments being made. Councillor Anderson wished to withdraw his call in, but unfortunately he did it three days too late. It should be done. If you're going to withdraw a call in, it has to be done before the publication of the agenda. But he was too late to do so, so therefore it has been published on the agenda. But I personally see no need to hear this. I, my personal opinion is that we should refer this back to the officer for delegated powers to be dealt with, but I need to ask your permission to be able to do that. So is there anyone against that move? Councillor Farquhar. Uh, thank you, Chair. I, I'm against that move because um, before joining this committee, I actually had a quick swat up on the Constitution, and I believe that the Constitution should be followed in this particular case, and that Councillor Anderson, since he called it in, should be here um, to uh, justify his calling. I appreciate that he may well have less, less missed the deadline, um, but uh, I myself have fallen foul of something similar, whereby I missed the deadline to make a representation for a resident. Um, but you have to stand by uh, your actions, I believe. Thank you, but on the understanding that the only reason this came to the board was because of the call-in, I will go to a vote of the members. Those in favour of delegating this back to the officer, please show. And those against, please show. Uh, Anyone abstaining? Two against. That move is carried and that will be delegated back for the officer's decision. Thank you, members. If I may, Chair, may you I may. have my book recorded? You may indeed, Councillor Farquhar. The Chair, meeting. Um, 
could I make the point that because this was um, withdrawn so late, I and I imagine other committee members had wasted journeys to go and view the site. Um, I appreciate which, that. Which is, is not on. I mean, that doesn't affect the outcome of this vote now, but for future notice, please, can we make it very clear that if people are going to change their calling, it should be done in plenty of time so that it, we don't... You're absolutely right, Councillor Lepedevin. It should have been, but he did it two days after. He thought it was seven days before the hearing, not before the, the um, publication of the agenda. So he has held his hand up. He has apologised for it. But he has saved a lot of officers' time by... Okay. This is a future learning lesson for others. For everyone, indeed. I agree. So let's move on to the agenda for this afternoon. And the first item we have this afternoon is 7A... 47 Compton Avenue, and I will ask Monica, and I apologise for not using your surname, Monica, but I would only embarrass myself if I tried. So would you present, please? That's fine. Thank you, Chair. Just wanted to confirm whether everyone sees my slideshow. We can. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Right. Planning consent is sought for demolition of the existing house house and the erection of two detached dwellings with associated access and parking at 47 Compton Avenue. This application has been deferred from the April committee due to some concerns with respect to its height, bulk mass, resultant plot sizes, the projection beyond the established building line and lack of path survey. Um, these issues will be addressed in this presentation and amendments were uh, submitted by the agent respectively. To uh, remind members of the site circumstances, the application site is occupied by a detached uh, dwelling, two-story house with an attached double garage. Uh, the site is located in the residential area, which is characterized by a variety of build form, architectural styles, finishing materials. The prevailing form of development is of substantial detached houses in large plots. However, the plot subdivisions are still present in the area with the immediate example of number 40 and 40A, 56 and 56A Compton Avenue. The side levels are rising towards uh, the rear of the site. So that can be seen on this uh, photograph. There is a retaining wall at the back, uh, which uh, then uh, separates the patio from the raised uh, bank, uh, which is occupied by trees. Um, the dwellings uh, located adjacent to the site are located on the uh, higher ground than uh, the application site. The proposal again is to demolish the existing dwelling, subdivide the plot, erect two uh, new houses on site. Concerns were raised previously with regards to the narrow frontages of the proposed new plot. Uh, the frontage of the existing plot is 25 metres in width, as it can be seen here, which is one of the widest plots in the nearest vicinity of this uh, as application site, um, and with other plots ranging between 15 to 22 metres in width. The proposed subdivision obviously would result in two narrower frontages, which would be directly comparable still to those of the plot subdivisions at number 40 and 56 Compton Avenue. That will be 13 and 12 metres in width, respectively, so directly comparable to these. As such, the proposed width of the newly formed plots would be in keeping with the pattern of the development along the Compton Avenue. In terms of uh, the resultant plot sizes, they would be smaller than those in the area. However, the proposed dwellings would still sit comfortably within their plots, assembling sufficient land to accommodate a dwelling with an off-road parking provision, adequate recreational amenity space for each plot, and without appearing cramped and overdeveloped. Concerns were previously raised with regards to the amount of hard standing on site. The scheme has been amended to reduce the amount of uh, hard standing at the back of the site that's the original layout of the development and the revised uh, plan is uh, to your right uh, that uh, introduced more soft landscape on site in terms of the amount of hard standing which is associated with the existing access parking and turning this is not increased um, beyond that what is already existing on site it's just to highlight again the frontages of both of these plots 12 and 13 meters as i said before comparable to the other plots in the area 
Concerns were also previously raised with regards to the siting of the proposed dwellings and their relationship with the established building line. The agent has provided a diagram providing some further information about the siting of these. In the red line, you can see the outline of the existing building on site. Obviously, there are two dwellings to replace it shown as well. The green extent shows the scale of two story, uh, which is already existing. The red one is the single story element. As you can see, the only element of the proposed scheme pro projecting beyond the existing building line of the existing building is associated with the single story garages to the front of the site. Um, turning to the issue of the building line altogether, uh, there is no a consistent building line along this uh, side of Compton Avenue. The buildings, as you can see, are staggered uh, with uh, being sited at an angle and at different distance to the highway. And whilst the proposed development would be sited closer to the highway than the existing house, only just a little bit, they would still be sufficiently set back from the highway to respect the established building line and the existing building line of the dwelling that already occupies the plot. And it would not appear out of keeping or unduly prominent by virtue of its siting. Whilst uh, the proposed dwellings, due to their result on scale, mass and design, would appear larger in the street scene than the existing uh, building that occupies the site, they would nonetheless respect the visual amenity of the area and would not appear unduly dominant or prominent within their setting due to the ground levels. And you can see on the street scene drawing in here that the site occupies a much lower ground than the adjacent development. Uh, and therefore, obviously, as you can see, the blue outline of the existing build form, the proposal would be comparable in height to that of existing. The design of the proposed dwellings would be also contemporary with large areas of glazing. And whilst dwellings along Compton Avenue are predominantly traditional in design and with uh, traditional finishing materials, there are also examples of modern uh, architecture nearby. And the immediate example, again, is number 46 Compton, uh, Compton Avenue, which is directly across the site. As a, as a result, the proposed design and finishing materials would respect the character and appearance of other properties within the surrounding vicinity of the site. However, concerns were raised previously with regards to the loss of the existing dwelling on site, and comments on this matter were sought from the Council's Urban Design and Conservation Officer, who advised, and I quote, this house has a 1980s aesthetics, but is actually a late 1990s, early 2000s building, which replaced an earlier structure which was erected under planning permission from 1998. I do not consider that this house has sufficient architectural and or historical merit to warrant resisting its demolition and replacement, end of the quote. In any case, as was previously discussed, the existing house could be demolished at any time under permitted development rights under Schedule 2, Part 11, Class B of the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order. That was previously advised as well. In terms of the impact on residential amenity, some loss of light and shading could occur to the side elevation of uh, number 49 Compton Avenue throughout the day due to the orientation of the site. However, due to the topography of the site, the proposed scale mass and siting of the new dwellings and the presence of intervening boundary, the separation distance to the uh, dwellings, the proposed new dwellings would not give rise to any further material loss of light or outlook to the occupants of number 49 than it is currently experienced from the existing building. Similarly, for the same reasons, the proposed dwelling would not have any overbearing presence towards their immediate neighbours. With regards to overlooking, the majority of the windows would allow views towards the public domain or the rear garden of the application site, which would not affect the neighbouring amenity due to the presence of outbuildings and mature vegetation along the shared boundaries. It is noted that both of the dwellings, number 49 and 45, would have uh, habitable uh, windows to habitable rooms within their side elevations. So to avoid direct overlooking and to protect the privacy of both the neighbours and the prospective occupiers, some obscure glazing is recommended by condition to avoid this conflict. There are several protected trees on site and um, on the adjoining land. Whilst these trees are well set back into the site, 
Uh, they nonetheless uh, form an important contribution towards the setting of the site and the sylvan character of the area. The proposal would result in the loss of the group of T2G, which is a group of Monterey cypress trees, which are protected to the rear of the uh, boundary, and also of an unprotected gum tree T1 within the site's frontage. The trees on site have been inspected by the Council's arboricultural officer, who raised no objection to their proposed felling due to their poor health and limited lifespan. The proposed scheme includes planting of six new trees on site, which will provide future tree cover and amenity contribution. The provision of native species of suitable, suitable size within the revised uh, agricultural matter statement can be secured by condition, and further details of landscaping can also be secured by condition. The application is also supported by a tree protection plan, which identifies the proposed development with all the excavations could be erected without causing direct or indirect harm to the protected trees that will be retained in the vicinity of the site, and that compliance with the tree protection plan can also be secured by condition. So subject to all these conditions, the Council's agricultural officer uh, supports the proposed scheme. The scheme is now also supported by the BAT survey. Um, no evidence of bats present was found on site, and the site holds limited potential of habit for habitat for commuting and foraging bats. The results of the survey were assessed and found acceptable by the Council's Biodiversity Officer, who suggested the compliance with the recommendations of the submitted report and recommended biodiversity enhancement. These also can be secured by condition. The, pro the proposed scheme is also compliant in terms of other aspects, including parking, highway safety and renewables. It will also mitigate any impact on heathland and harbour recreation through some contributions, and it would be also still liable. So in conclusion, given the shortfall of number of homes delivered in the local plan area, the balance is tilted in favour of sustainable development and granting planning permission, except where the benefits are significantly and demonstrably outweighed by the adverse impacts of where specific policies in the NPPF provide clear reason for refusal. The tilted balance approach forms a material planning consideration in this case. Whilst the site lies outside the most accessible locations in the borough and is not within the sustainable transport corridor as identified by popular policy PP2, this arrangement does not preclude the development. In such cases, the acceptability of the principle of the proposed scheme rests with its compliance with adopted policies. The scheme would contribute to the Council's demand for new housing and it would achieve social benefits of delivering an additional family unit in an established residential area in a manner that would preserve the character of the area without harming the residential amenity of the neighbours or protected habitat nearby. So having recognised the collective benefits of the proposed scheme, it is concluded that the scheme would achieve the economic, social and environmental objectives of the sustainable development in line with the adopted policies and the provisions of the NPPF, and it should therefore be recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Before I go to the officer to read out statements, I would just point out that Councillor O'Neill has now joined us for the meeting this afternoon, but due to the fact that he has come in through the middle of the presentation, he will take no part in this application. That is just for clarity and transparency reasons. Mr Tyler, could you read out any statements, please? Yes, thank you, Chair. So for this item, we have received two letters of objection, two letters of support, and we also have the Ward Councillor, Councillor May Haynes, um, dialing into the call to speak to this item. So starting with the first uh, letter of objection, this has been received by Mr. Mark Cuniff and other residents of 45 and 49 Compton Avenue and 25, 27 and 29 Blake Hill Avenue. The statement is as follows. These plans are a complete overdevelopment of the plot and not in keeping with properties along Compton Avenue, which are large single dwelling houses with appropriately sized gardens. This proposed subdivision, which is not common, will create two of the narrowest plots along Compton Avenue and be completely out of keeping with the established appearance and character, as well as having far-reaching implications for future developments. With the increased proximity of these houses to the road, they will have greater dominance, being at odds with neighbouring dwellings. The development will greatly affect the privacy of all neighbouring property, properties due to the resultant scale, mass and design, and be far more prominent than the current house. The removal of the four TPO trees will greatly impact the natural air quality and environment and completely affect the privacy of those adjoining houses in Blake Hill Avenue. 
These trees in December 2020 had conditions attached to protect them for the next 10 to 20 years. Yet only three months later, they are deemed to be at the end of their safe, useful life. The close proximity of the building lines will create loss of light and increased shade and will have an overbearing uh, appearance to all adjoining properties. Contrary to the planning officer's report, point number 47, this development will provide a substantial material loss of light and outlook to all properties in this objection. It has again been uh, documented in planning officer's report, point number 74, that there is no evidence to demonstrate that the site cannot accommodate the development in a manner that would not lead to the instability of the land or of the adjacent land. Can the planning officer please provide evidence that a qualified surveyor has determined this and that the extensive citation and significant tree removal would not have a detrimental effect to the integrity of all our properties and land. We also note that still no mention has been made as to how the developer plans to provide effective boundary retention treatment to numbers 45 and 49, or wall retention to numbers 25, 27 and 29. There are also no details of any mature vegetation to provide appropriate screening between numbers 45 and 49. At the last planning meeting, this application produced a mixed response with an inconclusive outcome, and all councillors were asked to visit the site in person to understand the full potential impact of this development. Can the chairman please confirm if all members have done this in order to make an informed decision? That's the end of the first letter of objection. The second letter of objection has been received from a Mr. Christopher Cotterell and Peter Norrie, um, who live at 40A Compton Avenue and 42 Compton Avenue. The statement is as follows. Um, little mention was made of the four Monterey Cypress TPO trees at the last planning meeting. Reviewing the case history of these trees over the last 20 years, the council have been extremely fastidious and diligent about what, and more importantly, what was not allowed to be done with these trees. Less than six months ago from this current planning application, an application to remove branches with defects such as cracks, splits and cankers was approved by the council. Even the council's arboricultural officer in the report to committee for this planning application confirms slow deterioration of their amenity over the next 10 to 20 years. It is simply not consistent or credible that within the last six months, the health and condition of these beautiful trees have deteriorated to an extent that they have a number of defects throughout their crowns that require immediate remedial attention and felling. An offer recently to have a third party unbiased review of these trees by an arboricultural officer was not taken up by the head of BCP planning services. Without the felling of these trees, the planning application cannot go ahead. The felling of these trees also does not meet with the pool local plan adopted in November 2018 with respect to climate change, planning policies, design and biodiversity that includes important habitats for bats and birds. The existing dwelling is a large property sitting within a plot that is not commensurate with its size. The proposed two-storey development will create two of the narrowest and cramped plots in the area. The existing property already has the largest built form plot ratio in Compton Avenue and the surrounding roads. This proposal will only exacerbate this situation. It will result in dwellings with unusable amenity space for required parking and manoeuvring areas and a permanent loss of verdant character. The property at number 47 was granted planning permission in July 1998. Conditions attached to the current property place great weight upon protecting neighbouring amenity. Since that date, the relationship with the adjoining properties continues and the properties in this row sit next to each other with little space between. The proposal will serve to further lessen the distances between properties, together with being an overbearing development to adjacent neighbours that includes an adapted residential annex accommodation and number 45 for a vulnerable person that so far has been ignored. The owner is not knocking the house down to relive in, the developer is, owner has left. That ends the second statement in objection. Um, the first statement in support comes from Tom Slaughter of Charlie Developments and uh, they are the applicant for this scheme. The statement is as follows. You may recall this item was before you at April's uh, committee, which resulted in the scheme being deferred for additional information in order to satisfy members that planning could be approved in line with the officer's recommendation. We have now provided the additional information that has been requested and provided further clarity to overcome the concerns raised by some members. This information is as follows. Firstly, a full ecological appraisal has now been carried out, which confirms the dwelling, garage and trees within the site hold negligible potential for bats due to a lack of potential roosting features and access points, thereby successfully overcoming this previous area of concern for some members. 
Secondly, Councillor Mayhane has raised concerns with regards to the building line being out of keeping with the street scene. To address this concern, our architect has increased the distance from the garages to the road. However, it's worth pointing out that previously the proposed houses were actually set back further into the site than the existing dwelling. This perhaps wasn't presented clearly enough on the previous submitted plans, so amended plans have been submitted, demonstrating that the new houses, even the single storey projections, are set behind the two storey central projection of the, of the existing house. So the proposed scheme actually represents a betterment in terms of reflecting and respecting the existing building line. Furthermore, Councillor Haynes raised a concern regarding the plot widths. The plot widths of the scheme are circa 12 metres and 13 metres respectively, which is almost identical to the plot widths at numbers 40 and 40A opposite, and the gaps to the neighbouring properties either side on our application exceed the distances to the neighbouring properties of number 40 and 40A. Not only this, other plots in Compton Avenue with plot widths of circa 12 metres include numbers 19, 29A and 37 Compton Avenue. Furthermore, this plot split approved at number 65 Compton Avenue recently approved hard, uh, recently approved had plot widths of less than 11 metres. So in terms of the rhythm and spacing of properties in the road, the proposed arrangement would be reflective or more generous in the case of number 65 than the surrounding arrangements. Thirdly, with regards to a point raised by one member about the site not being within 400 metres of a district centre, plot splits in this area are regularly are being regularly approved, and I believe my agent emailed you an OS map demonstrating that within 300 metres of this site, there are 16 examples of plot splits, all outside of 400 metres of a district centre. So I would request that members uh, to adopt a consistent approach in this regard. And that is the end of the first letter of support. The second letter of support has been received from Matt Annan of Pure Town Planning, who is the agent for this scheme. And the statement is as follows. We feel planning should be granted for the following reasons. Number one, principle. Your planning officer has set out in great detail at paragraph 17 to 31 of the report, the tilted balance argument, which stipulates that given the shortfall in the number of homes being delivered in pool against those that should have been built, the balance is tilted in favour of sustainable development. Thus, this scheme for an additional dwelling which sits comfortably on the site and with adjacent dwellings whilst respecting the established building line and assembling sufficient land to accommodate dwellings of an appropriate scale with compliant off-road parking provision and adequate recreational amenity space should be granted. Two, residential amenity. The proposed dwellings are a sufficient distance from all surrounding residential properties, such that along with orientation and fenestration arrangements, the scheme would not introduce any significant loss of privacy to surrounding residents. The houses are fully compliant with the minimum space standards and provide an acceptable standard of accommodation in terms of the size, internal layouts, outlooks, levels of daylight and private garden spaces, maintaining appropriate levels of amenity for the future occupiers. The proposed access and parking layout allow drivers to enter and exit the site in a forward gear and a policy compliant level of parking is provided with adequate visibility displays such that your highways officer is in support of the scheme. Three, trees. The proposal would result in the loss of the poor quality group of trees along the rear boundary of the site and one on the site's frontage. The removal of these trees is fully justified by a comprehensive tree report, which confirms that these trees have come to the end of their useful life. These trees will continue to experience branch failure and their visual amenity value will decline over the next 10 years. The Council's Arboricultural Officer has inspected the trees and has raised no objection to their proposed felling due to their poor health and limited lifespan. The scheme presents opportunity with the provision of six new trees, species and size to be agreed by condition, and enhanced amenity contribution to the area, providing future tree cover for the development and wider surrounding area. Councillors, we'd like to thank the planning officer for the additional work she has carried out between last committee and this second planning committee. And together, we feel this scheme delivers two family dwellings in a sustainable location, close to shops, services and schools, which would not adversely affect the character of the area or the amenities of neighbouring properties, nor detrimentally impact on protected trees. I hope you agree with your planning officer and team leader's recommendation to grant permission. And that is the end of the second statement of support, Chairman, so I'll pass back to you to invite the Ward Councillor in on this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Tyler. Uh, Councillor May Haynes, are you with us? I am, Chairman. I am here. Would you like to present, please? 
Yes, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, members of the Planning Committee, as has been presented by the case officer, there is very minimal change to the application since it was last considered by yourselves in April. There's been some amendment to the landscaping to the rear of the property and a bat survey is now part of the pack the documents for the application so similar to what the case officer has done i will actually reiterate the points that i had actually raised at the april meeting with reference to the subdivision members, we'll see that from the location plan document, um, and I think from the first slide that the case officer has presented, like yourself, Chairman, I, I'm not going to refer to the case officer's surname because I will get that wrong. Um, that is actually the smallest plot. And when I say the smallest plot, I know that the second letter of support, um, the actual applicant had said that he was talking about the width of the plot, but the plot size also includes the depth. If you were to compare it, which it is indeed being compared to, the plot size at 40 and 40A, those plots go far, far deeper. And therefore, from a plot size point of view, they are actually substantially larger than the plot in question here. So the application before you proposes similar size houses, excluding the garages, and we're talking in the context of 40 and 40A, but it is on a smaller plot. So I think as part of the character and the grain and the rhythm of the development, I think the plot size, not just the width and the street scene, but also the depth of the plot size needs to be part of the consideration. Um, and I know in conclusion, the case officer has made reference to the tilted balance in favour of development. But within the NPPF, NPPF 122 does talk about increased density of housing and that when weighing up an application, consideration needs to be given to paragraph C, which states the availability and capacity of infrastructure and services, both existing and proposed, as well as the potential for future further development improvement and the scope to promote sustainable travel modes that limit the future car use. Now, Compton Avenue is not on a sustainable transport corridor, which has been confirmed. The nearest bus stop is about a 13-minute walk away with a frequency of one hour per bus that runs between the hours of 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. So it's definitely not on a sustainable transport location. Further, MPPF 122 paragraph D also states the desirability of maintaining an area's prevailing character and setting, which includes residential gardens. The look and feel of the road is what attracts potential fu and future occupants. Smaller gardens with a more cramped appearance will detract from the existing character. So hence reference from the NPPF to the depth of a plot because most houses would have their main garden to the rear of the property. The proposal, in my opinion, will have a cramped appearance and reduce the gaps between dwellings. While unit one will be a little further from the boundary with the neighbours at number 45, please remember members that in the current arrangement, it is a single storey garage block, which will actually now become in the proposal a two storey built form and therefore substantially more bulk and massing, adding to the cramped appearance as a result of subdivision. Chairman, I'm very familiar with this area and in my view and that of the neighbours, as you heard from the representations that Mr Tyler has read out, would indeed cause harm to the rhythm and to include the ratio of built form to plot size of the established development um, in the area. While it is often said that each case is judged by its own merits, in approving this application, it will undoubtedly have an impact on any future development to the area which could serve to erode the current character to the street scene. And then we then have this phrase called the evolving character. There is already an existing character there and we do want to preserve that character. Um, Chairman, when this application was previously considered, there was no consideration to the trees to the rear of the property that will be felled to facilitate the proposal. Both the letters of objection have actually gone into quite a bit of detail about that, so I won't actually dwell on that point. 
I would ask members to consider very carefully whether the presumption for development, a net gain of, of one dwelling, is substantial enough to outweigh the harm to the character of this section of Compton Avenue, as has been stated in NPPF 122 as well. I would say that it is not and would urge members to refuse this application as it is contrary to policies PP27 and PP28. Um, Chairman, however, if the committee are minded to grant the application, then I would ask that an additional condition be included that the replacement trees for the ones that will be felled to facilitate the application, that they will be of a mature variety that would provide the same amenity value and help retain some of the character and the sylvan aspects of the area. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Haynes. Monica, is there anything that you've heard in any of the declarations that you wish to come back on, please? Um, and thank you, Chair. Yes, um, firstly, with regards to trees, uh, we've had regard to the tree situation and felling of the trees in the previous uh, report and uh, my conclusions. We do have a agricultural officer here present today with us in case of further queries, if members have them. Uh, however, to answer the Councillor Haynes uh, question with regards to provision of uh, mature trees, I believe semi-mature trees of specific girth uh, and planting pit can be provided and that's the aim of the condition uh, that is attached to uh, the report. In terms of the plot subdivisions, uh, and the policy PP2, yes, the site is outside of the sustainable transport corridor as identified by PP2. However, again, PP2 does not preclude any development based purely on its location as long as it provides uh, and complies with um, uh, relevant policies and the NPPF, which in my opinion, it, this development does. In terms of the um, depth of the plots, yes, uh, this plot is a little bit less in depth than uh, all the others. Uh, I have done a very quick calculation um, to actually present some of the figures. Uh, Councillor Haynes referred to plots at number 40, 40A, um, which vary between 55 and 60 metres um, in depth. Uh, that's across the road from the site. Dwellings or plots um, around uh, the site, which is namely number 45, has got a depth of 35 metres. Uh, the application site is 30 metres in depth. So that's that's a further clarification. In terms of the siting or any uh, site layout of the development, um, I again conclude that this uh, preserved the pattern of the development. Um, and therefore uh, satisfies the policy PP27, PP28. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. I will now go to members to speak. But before I did that, um, statements that was read out earlier asked if all members had actually visited the site. I know I have. Quick show of hands, have all members visited the site at some stage? Yeah, that seems that the majority of them have. Obviously, it's not compulsory that they do. It is an advantage if they do. But I'm glad to see that as many people as possible have done that on this occasion. My first speaker I have lined is Councillor Farquhar. Thank you, Chair. Um, before I ask the two questions, which I have, one relating to trees and one relating to uh, permitted build. Um, since I'm new to this particular uh, committee, on licensing where I sit, it's required that if there's a site visit that it is organised and attended by an officer. Is that not the case with a, uh, it's just for clarification. Site visits do happen as requested by the members of the planning board. They're a totally separate issue to members of the planning board going to look at a site on their own accord. As you know, in licensing, we can go and have a look from the outside, but it's not overly encouraged to do so. Um, but within planning, what we do do is we encourage members when they get their papers to go and have a look at the site from the outside, just to get a rough idea of what the areas are like and what it looks like. If a member feels very strongly that a site visit is needed, and if the officers also feel that strongly, we will organise an organised site visit where we go as one. So that when that happens, all members attend, the officers attend, members of the public are allowed to attend, but there's no, no conversation between members of the public and the planning board members or the officers. It's merely a case of us going to have a look. The officers will point out any major details that they feel is needed for us to see to be able to make a decision. 
and then that would that would happen normally in the morning of the planning board meeting but it's not a compulsory thing thank you chair i was concerned and you can understand um, that uh, there is always a, a danger of predetermination but i'm uh, happy with those conditions whereby it will be predisposition predisposition as opposed to predetermination um, based upon a visit either with planning officers or individually sometimes it's it's handy councillor parker because you get the plans on a map you can't always understand from a piece of paper where something is what it looks like what that tree looks like at the back of the house so sometimes it's really advantageous to go along have a look at the site for yourself and get a feel for what the officer's report is actually saying about that particular site and that development. So I, I would advise to do it wherever you can to go along when you get your papers on the Wednesday, go along, have a look at the site. You at least have a feel for what you're talking about when you come in the following week. Then it's, it's really handy, I, I found over the years. Thank you uh, very much, Chair. I'll take you up on that offer. Um, my question relates to the trees and uh, point 66 on page 21 of the pack. Um, just for the public, I'll just read it out. The proposed development presents a landscape opportunity for the provision of new trees and enhanced immunity to the area. The proposed scheme includes the planting of six additional trees that would supplement the retained trees within the site. Uh, I won't read it all out, but my question um, to the uh, to the to the planning officer um, is: the term six additional trees. Um, I can understand that, but I can't find in the report. How many trees will actually be removed because she because it's been referred to as a, as a group of trees to the rear of the property so i'd like the answer as regards how many physical trees are going to be removed and how many actual additional trees will be put in place um the second part of that question was that and it came up in the uh, uh the ward councillor's um request should it be granted um for mature trees the reply if i recall correctly was semi-mature. I'd like a definition of what a semi-mature is, because if we have an existing tree um, that's maybe 20, 30 feet in height, um, a semi-mature tree, to my mind, could be a tree which is only 12 foot in height, or, or maybe even six foot in height. So I think it's important to establish that if trees are going to replace trees which are felled, which have a tree protection order, exactly how, what type of tree and how big it's going to be um doesn't come out in the report and i realize that it's a condition in here so that's my first two questions would you like my third question you can throw that one in there as well. thank you very much it's um page 39 in the pack it refers to the uh the to the, the plan or the diagram there um for the footprint in the presentation the planning officer hang on work please slight technical hitch bear with me all right, there we go. Um, on page 39 of the report, um, members can see um, the existing footprint and the proposed new footprint. In the presentation, the planning officer referred to uh, under permitted build, demolition would be allowed. Can we just establish, please, um, the exact rules um, for my learning, as well as anything else, as regards for the demolition of a property and in this particular case, two further properties being developed, what is the percentage that's permitted under permitted build? And how does that compare as a percentage to the plans and the, and the overall square footage or square meterage or however it's measured on this plan on page 39, please? Thank you. I'll ask Mr. Answer that one on the permitted development part, if that's okay, Mr. Hodges. Uh, that's fine, Chairman. Thank you. Um, the demolition of the dwelling itself uh, can be demolished under what's known as a prior approval process. So the applicant submits uh, a prior approval application to the local authority, um, and that's in effect what we regard as permitted development. So our only control as a building's not listed or in a conservation area is simply around the method of demolition. So the fact that uh, they just need to go through that process we would in effect have no particular concerns um, over this particular site. Generally, we would only become involved if there was a contaminated land issue potentially and, and issues like that for demolition. Um, and it would be, a, I think it's a 28 day process. So in terms of the demolition, there's in fact nothing we can do to prevent the demolition of the property. Um, I think the second part of your question was to do with 
what's the proportion of what gets demolished against what gets rebuilt? Is that the correct, Councillor? If I may, Chair, yep. um, my understanding of permitted development is that a uh, householder or an owner or, the, or a particular site um, is permitted um, to increase the size of their property um, for the square footage as a percentage um, under permitted um, development. Um, looking at the plan, the existing footprint compared to the existing footprint or the proposed footprint of the two new properties looks percentage-wise substantially larger. So I wanted to understand under permitted um, development, if the property wasn't being destroyed, and let's say an extension was being built, what percentage is permitted um, within permitted development? Um, because it seems strange to me that you would demolish a building and then build a far larger footprint um, than was there previously. Hello. Yeah, please do, Ms. Hodges. Um, so, uh, no, the, the rules on permitted development changed from the uh, percentage or proportion years ago. So they're now simply about uh, dimensions. So there's uh, the possibility to extend it to the rear at ground floor by a certain amount, uh, to two storeys by a certain amount, to the side by a certain amount. Um, and those are all in terms of metres. Um, but not as percentages of the existing dwelling. So, for example, four metres to the rear, uh, not more than half the width of the house to the side, three metres of two storey to the back, and then uh, up to 50% site coverage for outbuildings and overall uh, in terms of dwellings. Um, so the number of options that you could extend uh, a large detached property with a substantial width uh, like the one before you is actually quite extensive. Um, I couldn't answer how much that would be, um, but if someone maxed out that opportunity, that would be uh, quite a sizable dwelling. And in terms of assessing the merits of this planning application, I don't think that's particularly relevant for your deliberations as the acceptability of putting two dwellings on there. Um, you just need to look at that uh, on its merits. Um, if you got up to a certain percentage, that doesn't mean the scheme was unacceptable or acceptable because those are policies aren't in the full local plan, for example, uh, Councillor Chen. Thank you, Mr Hodges. Monica, do we have the tree officer present? If so, could we bring him in, please? Yes, yes, he is. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon. I wonder if you could possibly answer the questions that Councillor Farquhar raised earlier with regards to how many trees were coming out and how many additional trees were going in and also the difference in requirement between a semi-mature and a mature replacement please. I can. Uh, four trees uh, are proposed for removal in the um, in the scheme. If you look at uh, the slide there you'll see the grey circles denote those trees. Um, in terms of six additional trees to go in, so four will be removed, six will be replanted um, as shown by the green circles. Um, th there'll be benefits of this is that we will have some better planting at the front of the site as well as the rear. Um, in terms of um, semi-mature trees, they they can vary, but in, in this scheme, I would expect them to semi-mature are usually trees with a stem diameter of 20 centimetres plus. So this isn't um, extremely large, as you, you might um, expect in, in terms of a replacement, but substantial in, in terms of what can be planted and uh, um, is likely to be um, maintained and, and survive. Um, these usually go up to five metres, sometimes six, depending on the species selection. And the difference between a mature specimen? A mature specimen is a, is a tree that's reached its um, uh, sort of so um, been in situ for for a period of time uh, much longer. Thank you very much, Councillor Farquhar. Does that answer your questions? If I may, just as a follow up, I, I was distracted by the diagram that's currently on the screen there, Chair. Um, Please forgive me, what, where in the pack is that? Because I don't think I've seen that diagram. 
is it not in your normal paperwork, your normal set of plans? Monica, um, could you indicate where that is in the plans that we have, please? It could be that the tree officer has put that up just as a better way of showing you what the situation is with the trees that are there. So it's just to confirm then, Chair, that diagram that's used there is physically not in our facts. I have no idea at this moment in time. I'm just waiting for Monica to answer, Councillor Falco. You're on mute, Monica. Are you there, Monica? Monica, you're on mute. That's better now. Apologies. No I just problem. wanted to confirm that the tree protection plan, there's an extract of it, which is shown on the screen right now. I do not have the whole pack in front of me, so I cannot confirm whether this is already in the pack. If it isn't, it's still nonetheless within the condition plan, uh, for the plans listing, uh, which then uh, requires compliance of uh, uh, the scheme with that, uh, with, with this, this plan entirely. Thank you question then because we talked about semi-mature and what size that they could be um, from this report here um, as I say I can't find it in my pack what size are each of the trees which are going to be removed please they are fully grown at this time so what size are the fully grown I trees don't think is, the, is my question yeah I um, don't think the officers would have the exact size to the centimeter of what those trees are Councillor Farquhar we just have to accept the officers statement that they are fully grown trees. Understood. Thank you, Chair. OK. Councillor Marion Lepedevin, please. Thank you. Um, first of all, I've just got two, what I imagine, are, I hope, are quick questions. Um, the first one is to do with the hard standing. That's the hard standing, the paving, whatever it was, at the back has been removed from the plans, this version of the plans. But, sure, is it not the case that if these are built and people move in, they could decide to build themselves a good big patio area. So um, would a condition be needed to prevent that, for instance? Monica? Uh, thank you. Uh, yes, well, first of all, yes, to answer the question in simple terms, yes, whoever um, buys the plot and has got a dwelling on it under permitted development, they can either remove this grass and put artificial grass, they can put a um, hard standing patio on it, they can dig a swimming pool uh, in the rear garden, they can equally uh, remove the hard standing to the front, uh, provide gravel uh, or provide lawn to the front, that's all uh, under permitted development rights. Um, removing those rights, it is within the remit, we could do that. However, it, I don't think it would be reasonable to restrict that uh, at this stage. However, it is possible if required. Thank you. So if I understand correctly, the fact that that has been removed from the plans is not necessarily of any long term benefit. I mean, um, we uh, obviously condition the plans, so the development needs to go in accordance with those plans. Uh, in that meaning, yes, of course, it needs to be built with the extent of the soft landscape as it is. However, in normal circumstances, I would not, and I don't believe any case officer would uh, guarantee that, let's say, in 20 years, someone would not come and change the uh, layout uh, and erect further extensions or change the, the soft landscape or hard standing on site. However, again, it is possible to control the extent of the landscape on site and the soft landscape of site, on site by conditions, by removing permitted development rights. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other question was about the depth of the site. Um, the, the officer gave us um, a figure for depth, I think it was 30 metres, but since it's a basically trapezium shaped site, uh, it's not regular. So what are the maximum and minimum depths of this site? So the, the depth neighbouring 45 and the depth neighbouring 49. Um, if I can have a few seconds, please, I will just give you both measurements. Um, Chairman, briefly, it's in Paris 37, um, the, the minimum and maximum uh, depths in Paris 37 of the report. Which are? It's in the paragraph. Yes, but I mean, 
Yeah, well, it's in the report, so, Council. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've got to find it. If, uh, yeah, well, if anyway, that's what else. the reports are for. <laughs> Chairman, just just Jen, briefly. So it's from um, so uh, Power Thirty Seven. Um, so it says the clock width is is uh, identical to number forty forty eight opposite. So scheme comparable in the street scene. Key difference is the depth of the application site. So from thirty one meters to twenty three meters, maximum to minimum. And in comparison, number 40 to 40A is 60 to meters to 56. So tapers from a minimum of 23 up to a maximum of 31 meters, Chair. So roughly less than half, really, the depth. Uh, could I just really quickly maybe answer that or provide further um, firm, do, further aspect? This is the... Um, the plot coverage or at least how it was approved uh, of number 40 and 48. As you can see from this diagram that you do have an extensive plot coverage uh, which is taken by the trees which um, we would basically refer to as a usable amenity area. In terms of the plot coverage yes there is a larger deeper plot However, in terms of the amenity, I would consider that at least one of the plots would be comparable or at least a bit larger than uh, the, the plots uh, on the application site. However, they would be comparable towards the layout in here. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor back for comments later. Okay. Councillor Bull. Um, a lot of what I was going to say was, was uncovered by uh, the agricultural officer. I was just wanting to know a little bit about the timeline from when they were originally TPO'd. It seems a short space of time from when they were originally TPO'd to now they are in a condition that they wouldn't actually get a TPO if put before you. Is, is that correct? Could the tree officer answer that, please? Yes. Um, I can't vouch for when the condition of the trees, when the TPO was placed, um, I do believe that some trees have been removed from the side of the property now. Um, basically, from my, it was my opinion, and whilst it's a subjective matter, that the useful life expectancy of these trees is likely to be approximately 10 to 20 years, and this is limited and considered to be short in our boricultural terms. And, and Jeff, yeah, please do. The replacement trees would obviously have a, a much longer lifespan. What would you estimate if they're natural um, native species? They will they will be what hundred years or something. Yeah, the, the species selection shown on the um, on the um, drawing there, I think, is is for Quercus species, species which is oak, and um, following the careful discussions between myself and the principal tree officer it was considered that the benefit of this new scheme was a good opportunity to implement new trees which would uh, be of greater longevity uh, a better species selection and future amenity for the locality so i would hope that those trees again depending on um several sort of uh their the plant how they're planted if they're planted properly and watered and, and survive and we can condition that they should go on to provide um up to 100 years plus of amenity. And, and one final point, therefore, if they, it was conditioned that they have to have to be have to remain, can it be conditioned that they have to get a chance to 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 stand a chance of survival for long in the long term? Yes, we would we would condition that um, uh, how the trees were planted with um, uh, the tree pits, the the survival and if if they did die within a five year period we would um uh, expect a replacement we could actually it can be that we can protect these trees um from from the point at which they're planted as well with a tpo yeah with a tpo it, it is normal that when we do a a scheme for planting and things that we normally do you do it with a five-year limitation on it so that it has to be for a five-year period Quite rightly, what you say, Council Bull, it's to protect them, to make sure they are looked after and given any future planting chance to establish itself and make sure it's maintained. So I'm quite happy with that to go in. Thank you well. for clarifying that, Chair. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Steve Barron. Thank you, Chairman. 
Well, these are the, the good old area orders that uh, everybody loves. Um, <laughs> this order was made, it was confirmed in 1981. Um, so basically, area orders are generally put on big areas to reduce the time in surveying rather than doing long winded surveys on trees, blocking the individual trees. They used to cover large areas of trees, but as years have gone by, um, it, 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 it leaves a lot of questions because um, 40 years ago, those trees were probably very small and just like I, I haven't actually managed to, I could only see them from the road. Um, but to me, from what I can see there, it they actually look like an overgrown hedge. They actually look like a historic hedge, which have, and this is another grey area, mm -hmm. when does a large hedge become trees? Yeah. Um, they're, they're macrocarpers and they're certainly not fully grown um, at all. And if they were, they would be shedding limbs quite on a regular basis. Um, that they're not a, not a great tree, especially on a windy site, and that is basically Blake Hill. <laughs> um, so, I, yeah, I'm not uh, as bizarre as it may seem. I'm not, not I'm not overly passionate about the trees that are there, and long term, I would rather see oaks. So, in your yeah. professional opinion, do you think replacement trees would be a betterment to the ones that are I there at this moment in time? I think long term they would, because in the next 20 years, they're, they're, they're probably already shedding limbs now, because they, mm -hmm. they, they, they grow out with all the foliage to the tips, and they get very leggy, and the wind catches them, and they just tear. That's what happens with, with, with macrocarpers. Um, but if the tree officer could just confirm whether or not they've previously been topped all at the same height, which would suggest that they were actually... It is actually an overgrown hedge, a historic hedge. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, tree officer? Yes. Looking at their form, it's unlikely that they were a hedge. They're a linear group, and given the spacings, hedging I would have expected to see um, closer together um, and, and a slightly different form. However, uh, upon inspection, the structural form of which was considered to be fair to poor with multiple branch defects defects present at my site visit so I concur with the councillor in terms of um, this species does have a propensity for shedding limbs um, and uh, end loaded branches which tear um, and which will certainly see their amenity diminish uh, slowly over the next period of 10 to 20 years. Thank you for that. Councillor Barron? Um, just to check is the tree officer absolutely confident that the trees were there in 1981? Tree officer? I consider it would be highly likely they were present in, in 1981, although they would have been much smaller. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you very much. That's, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I have any further speakers? Uh, Councillor Bartlett, please. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, from what I can see, there, there, there are two um, compelling reasons to grant this application. The one being the presumption in favour of sustainable development as in the MPPF, and also because the tilted balance applies in favour of development. So there's the two four. But equally, if there is harm caused by that, uh, then that you can actually challenge the, the, the the, those aspects. Now, in terms of the tilted balance, we're actually looking at one additional house. Yeah. Uh, so we then look at the harm that may be created by the development. Um, and I think there is harm, and these are um, these are specified in PP27 and PP28 of the uh, of the uh, the area plan. Uh, PP27 um, um, paragraph B. Uh, basically says that, um, you know, where you've got trees um, and they're protected, you, you shouldn't remove them. Uh, however, in this case, we've heard there is some mitigation from that uh, because, uh, you know, there was, uh, uh, we can plant some new trees and maybe that, that could be a betterment. Uh, but, you know, that that's a very subjective judgment on that. You know, it is contrary to the policy. Um, and, uh, you know, the policy is there for a reason to protect protected trees. Uh, but the main issue for me is about the subdivision of the plot and what that means in terms of the character uh, for the area. 
And whilst the width of the plots do appear to be similar to other um, frontages uh, in, the, in the immediate local area, certainly the depth of the plots is significantly smaller than anything else, uh, which means the community space uh, and the actual um, the area available for development for each plot it, it, it is much different from um, the, the, the majority of plots in the area. So for me, that makes it out of character. It, it results in a cramped development. Uh, you've got two fairly substantial new houses being really uh, on onto a site where normally in that particular area you would expect there to be one substantial house and that is the character in that in that area and so um for my, for, for my it's a very balanced judgment i have to say um and it could go either way but for me i think the development would be out of character for the area i agree with everything that ward councillor councillor haynes said about this in all respects she was absolutely spot on and therefore, I would actually not be in favour of the development and I would move to refuse this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, House of Bartlett. Do we have a seconder at this time for that move, please? Councillor O'Neill? Sorry, Councillor Hill, uh, Hall is what I meant to say. I'm happy to second. I think all the reasons that Councillor Bartlett said and the Ward Councillor uh, Ample reason for refusal. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Is there anything any other member would wish to say? Councillor Johnson. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be supporting that move. Um, I'm just going to air out my reasons here. So just to air a couple of things that haven't quite been mentioned as much yet. In terms of the size of the properties, as have been mentioned in many of the deputations, um, they mentioned it being overbearing, but I can't quite understand that point, given that the topography means that both properties sit far lower than either of the neighbouring ones. If you look at the plans on page 35 of the report, uh, the height of the roof of the garages to either side are nigh on level with the height of the properties in the development itself. So I can understand how there's any overbearing there when um, the garages of the properties either side are just as large or just as high uh, as the proposed development. In terms of the plot division, yes, there is some concern. Um, in terms of the width, I don't think there is because it's uh, clearly there are many examples on the road. In terms of the depth, I am concerned, however, not quite as much as some other members are here because in my mind, this is not going to be visible to any other property in the area. And in my mind, if it's completely invisible in that way, I cannot see how it will be detriment, detrimental to other properties. The only planning point, in my view, is whether or not they provide submissions sufficient. In my mind, they do. Those are not stingy gardens. Those are uh, certainly larger than, than the majority of properties. Um, so in my mind, there's no issue there. Um, as was mentioned, it's not closer to the road. It's actually set slightly further back, barring a couple of the corners of the garages. So I cannot see any reason to refuse there. Um, and I think the tree issue has been sufficiently thrashed out in that this will be a, a betterment to the area because the, the trees just aren't uh, aren't going to be of any use to the to the property for any great deal of time. So in my mind, I can't see anything that is a sufficient reason to refuse. So I'll not be supporting the move. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Um, I have to say a lot of what you say goes along with what I was thinking. I think the debate on this has been excellent again as it was when we heard it back in April and I think we've thrashed this out over and over again. I personally won't support the move. I think with the work that has been done we can sustain this and it, it can be done in a way that it's not going to affect the harm of the area. Um, each application is dealt with on its merits. I know Councillor Haynes brought this up in her conversation but we do have to deal with each one on its merits and each one is different and it always has been that way. Um, so therefore, I won't support the move. I would prefer this one to be granted, but I'm in the hands of the committee as always. And I will therefore go through the list of names and ask those in favour of the move to refuse to say for, and those that are against the move to refuse to say against. Chairman, um, just in order, just, I, if, if possible, if we could just uh, clarify, uh, Council Bartlett, then the reasons for refusal. Yeah, um, I just for the record, uh, so my understanding was. 
uh, the concerns are about the impact on the character and appearance of the area um, and that's in relation to policies uh, PP27 and yep. PP28, yep. Uh, particularly of the pool local plan. So PP28 uh, talks about plot severances and subdivisions. Yep. Um, so clearly applicable. So residential proposals involving plot severances or subdivisions will only be permitted where there's sufficient land to enable a tight scale and layout, including parking and usable amount of space, uh, to be accommodated in a manner which would preserve or enhance uh, the area's residential character. So I just want to clarify, and when, uh, but there's not a reason on residential amenity or living conditions. Thank you, Chairman. That's helpful. No, I, I've got down here PP27 and PP28. That was what I understood, Councillor Bartlett. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of 28, uh, PP28, paragraph 2, specifically, yeah. that this development is contrary to, to that policy. Thank you. Uh, and also uh, PP27, uh, I think it's 27B, which relates to the trees, lots of trees. Thank you very much. So I will start with Councillor Johnson. Against, Chair. And Councillor Stephen Barron. Against. And Councillor Stephen Bartlett. For. Councillor Simon Bull. Against. Councillor Malcolm Davies. Against. Councillor Derek Borthwick. Okay. Councillor George Farquhar. Four, and if I may, order for a minute. Councillor Peter Hall. Four. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Against. Councillor Marion Lepedevin. Four. Councillor Beverly Dunlop. Against. And myself, Councillor David Kelsey, also against. Could I have the numbers, please, Mr. Tyler? Certainly, Chairman. Thank you. So the total number of uh, votes for the move is four and the total number of votes against the move is eight. There were no abstentions, so that move has fallen, Chairman. Thank you. I will therefore go to a second move and I will move the recommendation of the officer's report and I would seek a seconder to do so, please. Councillor Johnson, thank you very much. So therefore, we have a move by myself, seconded by the Vice Chairman, Councillor Johnson. Again, I will ask for and against on that move. And I will start again with Councillor Toby Johnson. Sorry, before we do that, could I please ask that we had the condition to ensure that the maintenance of the trees is in place, a landscaping scheme, to ensure that is in place. Chair, and, uh, yes, and a requirement for replanting for five years. Yes, yes please, if we could. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Councillor Johnson. Oh. Councillor Stephen Barron. Four. Councillor Stephen Bartlett. Against. Councillor Simon Bull. Four. Councillor Malcolm Davies. Four. Councillor Derek Borthwick. Four. Councillor George Farquhar. Against. And if I may have my name recorded in minutes, please. Councillor Peter Hall. Against. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Four. Councillor Marion Lepedevin. Against. Councillor Beverly Dunlop. Four. And myself also for Mr. Tyler. Thank you, Chairman. So, yes, the total number of votes for the move was eight. The total number of votes against was four. No abstentions. So that move has carried. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. So, therefore, that application is granted in line with the officer's recommendations. Thank you very much. We will now move on to the second item for which, Councillor Bartlett, you are not going to participate. Thank you for that. And that is Kingswell Road in Bournemouth. And this is going to be presented by Mr. Charles Raven. Mr. Raven. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Just starting my slide show. Uh, can you confirm that you can view that, please? We can. Thank you, Mr. Raven. Thank you. So uh, this application seeks consent uh, for the erection of a three bedroom detached dwelling, uh, the formation of a new vicar access and four parking spaces under a carport at 19 Kingswell Road. Uh, firstly, I'd like to take you through some um, photos and general characteristics of the application site with the aid of some um, aerial views. You can see the application site outlined in red in front of you. Um, it's a closer view, just showing the uh, proximity of the neighbours and the general characteristics of the, um, of the plots there. 
Uh, this is an aerial view of the site. You can see it's quite a large site with a double frontage. Um, the area is residential in character and contains mainly two storey detached dwellings of a traditional appearance, um, although there is some variety in the specific detail of finishes, roof forms and building sizes. Um, there's also evidence um, throughout the area. Um, the properties to the rear, you can see in the lower part of the, um, the image, uh, are generally single storey bungalows. Um, the application site has a wide double width frontage and interestingly there is not a number 17 Kingswell Road which is an indication that a new dwelling in this position was historically expected. Uh, it's just, just some uh, street views you can see the um, application site in front of you number 19 on the right and number 15 on the left. Um, you can see number 21 further to the right hand side and this is a view showing number 21 and number 19. Um, looking at the planning history, um, outline permission was actually granted for a two storey dwelling to the side of number 19 in 2003. Um, so the principle of residential development on the site has previously been accepted. Uh, consent was more recently refused by the planning board of the former Bournemouth Clara Council and a subsequent appeal was dismissed for a detached dwelling. Uh, the appeal decision is a material consideration in the consideration of this application, uh, which aims to address the issues raised by the inspector, and a copy of that appeal decision uh, was provided at the end of the officer's report. Um, but in a nutshell, it was clear reading the decision that there was not one determining factor that resulted in the inspector dismissing the appeal, but that taking all of the minor negative issues collectively, the scheme could not be supported. So turning to the current scheme, um, the building proposed is two storeys to eaves, um, the height of which would be joining properties. Uh, the front building line is respected. The, the design is of a traditional appearance with a double height bay window and a hipped roof, uh, the same pitch as those neighbouring. Uh, facing materials would be a combination of brick and, and render, again similar to many properties within the immediate vicinity. Uh, the proposed dwelling has been reduced in depth uh, when compared to the previous scheme, so is now comparable to those either side. And just as a way of clarification, um, this is a um, image of the previous, the layout of the previous scheme, and you can clearly we can visibly clearly see um, and appreciate the layout was a lot more cramped than is currently proposed with um, the car parking space in the frontage and the, the very tight uh, car parking spaces um, between the properties. Uh, and this is the new layout which um, provides the parking in the in the rear garden area. So as with the previous scheme, um, the buildings around one metre narrower than those neighbouring. Uh, which would affect its proportion slightly and consequently results in a marginally lower ridge height when compared to those either side. Um, your officers consider that the width of the building would not be cramped or out of character and would ensure a characteristic gap between the buildings is maintained. Um, there are many house types of varying widths throughout Kingswell Road and the surrounding area. There is not one predominant building type to dictate what must be acceptable in this location. Um, either in terms of appearance or scale. The narrower form alone is not considered to harm the character of the appearance of the area, where it would share an otherwise similar design. Um, it would actually be more in keeping than a number of existing dwellings in the area, um, closest being number 21, which you saw previously, which is a newer property with a different and weaker design. It's therefore maintained that the uh, development would be in keeping with the character and appearance of the area. Uh, the current scheme provides a, uh, a landscape area to the front of both properties, where previously there was a uh, car space proposed, and this would soften the impact of the development and would be entirely in keeping with the character of the area and result in a less cramped appearance than previously considered. Uh, the applicant uh, provided amended plans during the consideration of the application, which provided a carport over the proposed rear parking area. 
the carports would be of a timber structure with a flat sedum roof. Uh, the structure would be single storey with a maximum height of 2.7 metres and would be open sided. Uh, the carport would be set in from the side boundaries by 2.5 metres and from the rear by 4.5 metres. And whilst the carport is large, um, it provides cover for up to four vehicles. These are not uncommon in urban areas and given the single storey nature of the structure and it's sighting well away from boundaries, there are no planning, planning reasons or grounds to object. Um, I'm just going to go back to the aerial of the surrounding area. Um, around 43% of properties within Kingsborough Road have off street parking facilities located behind their rear elevation of the dwellings, effectively within the rear garden areas. They're a combination of garages, uh, carports, and open parking areas. So the principle of parking to the rear dwellings is considered to be well established throughout the area. Uh, the proposed dwelling is considered to be a small family size dwelling house um, for the purposes of your policy CS20, which states that there will be presumption in favour of the redevelopment of sites for small family dwelling houses, as opposed to other forms of uh, residential developments where the site is capable and suitable for accommodating small family houses and the resulting development will not be out of character with the local area. So as discussed, the site is capable of providing this small family dwelling, which has been shown not to be out of character with the local area. Uh, the term is, is considered to satisfy the requirements of this policy and the provision of family housing should be supported. Uh, turning to residential amenity, uh, in dismissing the previous appeal, the inspector cited two issues relating to amenity. Firstly, the position of a window serving a bedroom in the east facing flank elevation of the previously proposed dwelling would have resulted in overlooking and a loss of privacy to the detriment of the future occupiers and also occupiers of number 15 Kingswell Road. So in response, the current scheme has been amended to only provide secondary windows at first hall level in this elevation, serving a bathroom and an ensuite. And both of these um, windows will be fitted with obscure glazing and fixed shut. Um, so therefore, there'll be no opportunity for any overlooking and consequently no loss of privacy. Uh, the requirements to provide mechanical ventilation to these uh, rooms will be dealt with under building regulations and is entirely common in urban areas. Uh, the second reason um, relates to the narrow gap between the proposed number 17 and number 19, um, as the proposed parking layout would have made it difficult to get in and out of vehicles and also result in difficulties moving bins. The inspector did state that this was not a determinative matter, but weighed against the other issues at the time. So in response, whilst the access remains as previously um, uh, proposed, it no longer serves as a parking area. This has been moved to the rear and together with a turning area will allow vehicles to enter and exit the site in a forward gear. Uh, rear pedestrian access to the two properties would not be compromised, uh, meaning bins can now easily be moved to the frontage on collection days. Uh, these issues raised by the inspector have therefore been successfully addressed. The only new issue to consider is the impact of the parking area. And as stated, the provision of car parking to the rear of the frontage buildings is a common feature in this area. Uh, the carport and parking area is sited away from the immediate boundaries, so the impact could be arguably better than the norm of having vehicles parked tight to the boundaries. And given the anticipated use of the parking area serving only two households with one central access, the level of activity is likely to be commensurate uh, with the existing residential uses and therefore considered acceptable. Uh, the physical structure of the carport is low level with open sides and a green roof located away from the boundaries. This is not considered to result in a demonstrably harmful impact. Uh, the size of the proposed property exceeds the minimum requirements as advocated by the technical housing standards. Uh, the private garden area is suitable for the size of property proposed, as is the residual garden serving the host property. Uh, the development provides two off road parking spaces for each of the new and host properties, together with required electric vehicle charging points. 
uh, the development is considered to offer a good standard of accommodation for the future occupiers. Your highways officer confirms that a level of parking revision complies with the requirements of the parking standards SPD, providing two parking spaces each for the proposed and the existing house. Revised plans were submitted during the consideration of the application to address the issues raised by highways officer, who confirms that the required pedestrian visibility displays, access, parking areas, and the electric charge points are now provided and does not raise any objections with regard to highway safety or the level of parking. Uh, the applicant has indicated their willingness to enter into a legal agreement to provide the required financial contribution for the mitigation of the development on protected heathlands in line with the adopted heathlands SPD, and the development will also be subject to a payment of the community infrastructure levy. Chairman, in summary, the proposal provides a small family-sized dwelling in a sustainable location. The impact on the appropriate the impact on residential amenities being assessed and considered appropriate. The level of car parking provision is policy compliant. There is no harmful impact on highway safety. The impact on heathlands will be mitigated. And the issues raised by the inspector taken as a whole are considered to have been addressed. Um, I'd also state at this point the requirements of paragraph 11 of the MPPF have not been engaged given the recommendation to grant and your officers therefore recommend approval in line with the recommendation and conditions cited in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Raven. Mr. Tyler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And so for this item, we have received one letter in objection, no letters in support, um, but we do have the Ward Councillor, Councillor Jackie Edwards on the call to speak to this item. So starting with the letter of objection, this is coming from a Mr. John Rowland, who is a local resident, and he has written, uh, this application varies little from the 3029H application, which was rejected by planning committee, went to appeal and was sub subsequently rejected by the planning inspector. For street scene, uh, the case officer of 17 would give the proposal a cramped appearance, further emphasised by the dominant use of hard standing at the front of the site. Appearance and size of 17 is very similar and hard standing in front of 19 has been replaced with grass, but this will make no difference to the overall visual effect for previous refusal. In relation to the rear of the site, this application has incorporated four parking bays with carport supports making vehicular movements difficult and two turning areas accessed by a communal driveway between 17 and 19. This will cause noise, disturbance and pollution to five adjacent rear gardens and also 17 and 19 with vehicles passing close both dwellings. Nowhere else in the area enclosed by Kingswell Road, Henford Road, Henford Gardens and Kingswell Close do vehicles access the area behind dwellings. Two thirds of the land behind 17 and 19 will be taken up by driveway, parking bays, turning spaces and an area of ground between the parking bays and the boundary which is unlikely to be used because of its unsuitable position. This leaves only one third of the land behind 17 and 19 as usable amenity for both properties. In relation to the Bournemouth core strategy, policy CS21, part of this states a proposal should enhance the street scene, respect amenity and positively contribute to the neighbourhood and achieving a sustainable community. This does not respect amenity nor positively contribute to the neighbourhood. Policy CS22, plot severance will not preserve or enhance the area's residential character as parking arrangements will drastically reduce existing amenity. Policy CS41, this development does not respect the site and its surrounding for occupants or neighbouring residents. The parking proposal will have a negative effect on the surrounding residents. With the likely removal of the privet hedge between 17 and 15, all biodiversity and habitat will have been removed from the site, which was a wildlife haven before recent applications, as has been stated in comments on previous applications. CS41 also states that development, which by virtue of its design would be detrimental to the built environment, amenity or character of any part of the borough will not be permitted. Policy 6.8, the proposed layout does not ensure neighbouring amenities will be adversely affected as the parking proposals will have a significant impact on adjoining residents. This proposed development has more issues with parking arrangements than the previous application, which was rejected by the planning committee, whose decision was subsequently upheld by the planning inspector. 
And that is the end of Mr. Rowland's letter of objection. And Chair, I'll pass back to you to invite the Ward Councillor in. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tyler. Councillor Edwards. Good afternoon, Chair. Good afternoon. Thank you for, letting, you me, uh, thank you for letting me speak. I called in this application as I'd been approached by residents concerned over the plan to build a house between 15 and 19 Kingswell Road. This plot of land has been the subject of several planning applications and a dismissed appeal. The current application still does not rectify the problem that the house will be narrower than those in this section of road. Number 19 has a width of 7.3 metres and the proposed house only 5.3 four metres, making it appear cramped and thus affecting the street scene. However, residents are also concerned over the proposed parking at the rear. This will severely impact on five neighbouring gardens. I've searched Google Earth to see other houses in Kingswell Road that park at the rear of their houses. I've only been able to find a few. This road favours parking at the front of the houses. All the houses in this part of Kingswell Road have gardens back to back. Putting a carport would be totally out of character and dominate the area. Neighbouring residents will be subject to the noise and pollution of four vehicles and this will spoil the enjoyment they currently have in their gardens. Much of the garden area has been given over to the park application down whilst the option for parking at the rear and the building of a narrower house is being presented. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. Mr. Raven, is there anything you'd like to come back on, please? Uh, and, um, yes, I mean, I, I think I've covered all points raised in, in my presentation, but just to reiterate, I would, I would state that the removal of the car parking to the front of the development um, is, is actually a betterment and would um, lead to a more open nature of scheme um, it would be betterment to the street scene it would appear less cramped there'll be more open space between the road frontage and the built form um, the size of the amenity area um, for each of the properties as a general rule of thumb and this is this is not set in stone or um, a policy um, we'd usually seek to have um, a rear garden area, the same footprint as the main building that it's serving. So as you can see from the from the plan in front of you, the um, the size of the garden area is essentially exactly the same size as the um, the footprint of the buildings that they'll be serving. So, um, you know, a ten and a half metre um, deep garden for one and a ten metre deep garden for the other. Um, I think this is entirely appropriate uh, and a good level of amenity space. Um, the area around the um, the parking to the rear and the carport will be landscaped, and that's well secured by condition. Um, the roof of the um, of the carport will be a cedar green roof. Um, it's a very low level structure. Um, if it was twenty centimeters lower, it could be built with under permit development. Um, so that's an option open to the applicant if they wish to do so. Um, I'd have to disagree with Councillor Edwards because I, I, I did a, um, a very thorough assessment of the area in terms of parking to the rear of properties in uh, Kingswell Road and almost half of properties have some sort of parking to the rear of the main building. So um, I, I cannot agree that parking in the rear garden area to the, behind the properties is, is out of character. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr Raven. Members, is there anyone who would like to kick off on the debate on this one? Councillor Lepedevin. Thank you. Um, as usual, I've got a couple of questions to start with. We've heard about the width of the proposed 17 being a metre narrower than 15 and 19. But what about 21, the new house that's been stuck in a few years ago? That on the plan looks as if it's very similar to the pr proposed 17. So I would be grateful if the officer can confirm. Um, I'd have to do some measuring in the background if that's all right, but yeah, you, you can see physically it's um, it's it's narrower um, or as as narrow as the proposed building. But if you give me a minute, I can measure it. OK, I'll move on to the next and I'll come back to you in a second on that one. Councillor Dunlop. Thank you. Um, 
Can we just have a look at the frontage, the current frontage, first of all, please, the street scene? So am I right in saying that most of the houses in that particular road have off street parking or they've got um, frontage um, hard standing that's been cleared away? Um, first of all. Yeah. But my question is actually around the, um, I'm not quite sure how to frame this, the, um, the, the I guess the idea of um, tearing up a garden to create parking spaces. It's contrary to where we're going, Chairman, in terms of what we're doing with parking and car use. And while I accept that it's um, it, it's strictly in accordance with the SPD, um, and I might be wrong, does the current property actually have off-road parking at the moment? So are we, in fact, creating for brand new parking spaces that don't exist in that road. Sharon, if I may, you can see from the photo in front of you, there's um, the existing property has three off-road parking spaces, two to the side and one to the front. Um, and the garden area is, um, is fenced off, as you can see. So in actual fact, Council Dunlop, there's only an increase of one parking space overall on what is there at the moment just and the, and, and the removal and overall of, yeah yeah but the, 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 so if we just say that the the benefit is the removal of the cars from the frontage in terms of the impacts on the character and appearance of the area right forgive me if i've misunderstood the plans of the current residents in that uh, uh, the donor property they're all currently parking at the front are yeah. they there's no yeah. real parking okay um Chairman, I'm not sure what the, what the material planning point is here, but I do have a major concern with tearing up gardens to create in the middle of groups of, of gardens. It, it is worrying me. I'll ponder on that one. Thank you. And going back to Councillor Le Pedivin's question, Mr Raven, on the size. I've no other chance, unfortunately, because I've been answering other questions. Sorry, I'll, I'll let you do that. We'll breathe while you do that. Looking at it, they look like they the proposed one and the one that's already existing do look very similar. Look very similar. Yeah, very similar. I've done a, a rudimentary measurement, yeah. and they, they appear to be very, yeah. very similar. Yeah, I and mean, if you think about it, uh, I know a metre sounds a lot, but it's like a foot and a half either side. Yeah. So I know it sounds a strange way of looking at it. Okay, please. On that. Carry on. My, my point was going to be that it appears to be very similar in width to the number 21, which is which really does look crammed in. Mm. I mean, even on the photo that's on the screen now, yep. it looks crammed in. Uh, the other point is that design-wise, it's totally out of thing. The proposed, the proposal we're looking at at number 17 is of a very similar design to 15 and 19 and other houses in the street. I think it will be perfectly in keeping and it would not, from what I can see on the plans and the elevations, appear as crammed in as number 21 does. So um, number 21 has set a bad precedent in that respect. I don't know how long it's been there um, and when it was agreed to, but the fact that that has been agreed to and built and now is lived in and has been for a certain amount of time, several years, um, means that I can see no problem with number 17. Um, the officer says that the precedent uh, of back garden parking is well established. It's going to have a sedum roof, so there will be um, ecological, uh, at least uh, mitigations and electric charging points, which again, many will not provide, um, that I can't see a reason not to accept this, and therefore I'm prepared to move. Thank you, Councillor, for that move. Councillor Barron. Happy to second that. Chair. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Before I go to any moves, are other people wishing to speak? Councillor Farquhar. 
Yeah, saying it, Chair, um, it might not be appropriate for this committee, but uh, it would certainly help my knowledge and understanding. Um, there is often an issue over, um, or has been to my experience, over shared driveways. My question relates to this um, uh, carport with a seat and roof, and that is to be uh, commended. Um, it might be helpful just to um, uh, confirm the policy as regards um, parking spaces and the provision of electric charging points. Um, but my question is, is that should the new property be built or the permission be granted, who is responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of the carport with a seat and roof? and the, um, the electric charging points. I'm, I'll take your guidance whether or not that is a question for this committee. Um, my, my other question is, is that, um, as the uh, ward councillor presented, is that these gardens are back to back and it's a loss of immunity for the neighbours um, to have a carport in this particular space and that on her survey on Google Earth, um, that she could find little evidence of vehicles um, being parked on the backside of the uh, the properties on Kingswell Road. Um, I followed her lead on that, um, and the question for the officer is, um, because in his reply, if I heard correctly, was that there was a um, there was evidence, or there was a predominance of evidence. Um, I calculate that there is approximately 87 properties on the length of Kingswell Road on that particular side. Um, can the officer confirm um, how many properties um, actually were surveyed on, on the length of Kingswell Road, how long Kingswell Road actually is, yeah, and how many properties did he find to be on that side of the road to actually have car parking facilities to the rear, if you please. Thank you. Mr Raven. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I can't answer those questions, unfortunately, because it's not... I don't have the information, but I surveyed every single property on Kingswell Road and looking at every single property, 43% of properties had parking to the rear of the main buildings. Um, all, you know, that could either be in the form of a garage, in the form of open, open parking or carports. But the fact is 43% um, of the entirety of the road had parking behind the main frontage. Thank you, Mr Raven. Any further comments from members at this moment in time? Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, just a couple of things. Um, Councillor Falkar, could you turn your microphone off, please? Sorry. Thank you. Uh, ju just a couple of small things. Um, I think um, Councillor Lepedevin uh, hit the nail on the head. When you look at the photograph that's on the screen there, the two properties immediately to the right are incredibly crammed in. Um, and by contrast, uh, number 17 will still leave a a rather generous uh, gap between the properties that is very much in keeping with the other properties along the road. Um, also, could I just ask Mr Hodges to confirm once again that if it was if it was laid with a permeable surface, uh, the garden could be converted into hard standing under permitted development as is? Uh, yes, Chairman, that's my understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hodges. So as, as far as I'm aware, as, as removing gardens is is not is not something that I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. As far as I'm concerned, there's no planning reason to to refuse it as much as I don't like it. So I will be supporting the move. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. Councillor Barron. Thank you, Chair. Yep, I, I I sort of reluctantly agree. Um, you know, as as much as I'd like that privet hedge to stay there, um, it could be taken out tomorrow quite legally. Um, the lawn could be taken up. Um, I also think that the architect's gone to great trouble to to make the house look in keeping with the with the street scene um which is why i was happy to support the the move thank you chair thank you Councillor Marin. It, it, it is a shame about the uh, prospect of having four parking spaces there, especially what as a council what we're trying to do but the fact of the matter is if the owners of that property want to go and park around the back on a hard surface they could do whether you give them permission or not because they could, they could just go and do it and we'd have no say over it the fact that they, sorry, uh, Councillor, you have one second and I'll come to you. The fact they're going to have a seed and roof is going to be the responsibility of the owners of that property in answer to Councillor Farquhar's question. That will be the owners of the property's responsibility to look after that carport and to make sure that it's safe and in decent use, along with the seed and roof on top as well. So that will be their responsibility to deal with. Apologise, Councillor Hilliard, I forgot to come to you. Please. No problem, Chair. Thank you. Uh, just a question, please, for the officer. So the uh, 
previous application and the inspector's comments were about both the width and the depth. And the officer said the depth had been greatly reduced. But could, could he confirm the width also? Because that was a key consideration on their look and feel. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, um, the depth has been reduced. As you can see, the, this is the previously um, proposed depth, um, which... Right, I'll throw that is. Could you please turn it off? which extends um, quite some way past uh, number 19 and it's in line essentially with the single story root extension of number 15. Um, the current proposal you can see is essentially in in line with number 19. Um, the width remains as previous. Um, that's just essentially that's that's the full that's how wide they're able to go. They can't go any wider and retain um, the, the access um, for vehicles to the rear. Um, the only reason that the previous scheme was approved back in 2003 was because the uh, requirements for access and parking um, was um, much lower than it is today. Um, but yeah, essentially the uh, um, the width remains the same, but all other issues have been addressed and um, um, I consider that um, all of those other reasons have been successfully mitigated and addressed. OK, thanks for confirming that, because I, I, I read it differently. I, I read the inspector's report really focused on the look and feel of the street scene. And if, if that's no different because the width is the same, uh, I, I, I can't see how we can uh, agree this. The other aspect, we the report clearly talks about the amenity of uh, residents in overlooking and things like that and it closes that no there's no overlooking or whatever but for me <laughs> potentially four cars in the rear garden moving uh, maneuvering reversing and, and then turning around to go out is 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 affecting amenity i also looked at google earth and like the officer confirms there are rear parking but it is just a one lane to a garage so it's going to be forward one car reverse one car no two and a throwing uh and you're limited to one so i i can i cannot uh, go along with acceptance thank you thank you councillor here and again apologies for not coming councillor I, I, i've just been looking at the inspector's report and in, in paragraph seven it talks about the remaining width between 19 and 17 of the previous application will be narrow, making it difficult to get in and out of vehicles parked between the dwellings. Well, that is not in the current proposal. Mr. Raven. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah that's entirely correct. Um, as part of um, one of the reasons to over, well, one of the re reasons for issues to overcome was the cramped nature of, um, of the previously proposed parking between the built form and hence the reason why the parking has been moved further to the rear to um, to allow vehicles to enter and exit in a forward gear and also to allow um, the residents to access to their um, rear gardens and to allow the bins to be moved um, to the to the forward of the um, to the forward of the buildings on, on collection day. Thank you Mr. Raymond. Any further comments from members? Councillor O'Neill. Uh, thank you. Can the officer take us back to the picture of the street scene and the frontage of the property as it exists at the moment? Thank you. That's the one. Um, yeah, I visited this property. And I don't get the same feeling standing out the front of the property as I do looking at this picture. And what concerns me is, are we trying to shoehorn a property in that will actually change the character of this street. Could the officer concern, uh, could the officer confirm the width of the vacant area between the house that exists and the hedge? Could he also confirm the width of the access road to the rear of the property as it will be? And could he also confirm the width of the house to be built? because it looks to me a very, very cramped proposition. And I'd love to understand those dimensions, please. Mr. Raven. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, so, the, so the width from the boundary with number 15 to the 
property at number 19 is, um, I would suggest, a little over eight and a half metres. Um, the width of the proposed building is 5.4 metres. The width of the proposed access is three metres. Um, the width of the width, width number 15 is uh, 6.4 metres. Um, the width of number 19 is slightly larger at 6.7 metres. And I've um, confirmed that the width of number 21 is just over 5.9 metres. A, a difference in widths along this road and that's just literally within the first four properties that we're looking at here if we went and did, did the whole thing you'll find um even greater bits i mean just looking at the photo go across the road on the right hand side that's a double width property there um and if you go on left hand side the width of the property there it, it's 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 narrower again so there's a multitude and no one sort of a homogeneous uh, width of built form um, this is an uncharacteristic gap in the street scene, and um, I think that the applicants have um, done a good job to fill it with an uh, appropriately uh, designed and finished uh, building. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Raven. Clarification, I, I still have a concern that uh, whilst the design is not unattractive, that the build scale, the bulk and mass, uh, really is out of character and the access road to the rear is very tight. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. There being no further comments, we do have a move on the table, and that move is from Councillor Marion Lepedevin and seconded by Councillor Steve Barron to grant this application. Again, your usual formalities, I will call names one by one if you could answer for or against, please. So starting with the Vice Chairman, Councillor Johnson, for. And Councillor Stephen Barron. Four. Councillor Simon Bull. Four. And Councillor Malcolm Davies. Four. Councillor Derek Balthwick. Four. Councillor George Farquhar. Abstain. Councillor Peter Hall. Four. Councillor Paul Hilliard. Against. Councillor Marion Lepedevin. Four. Councillor Tony O'Neill. And uh, Councillor Beverly Dunlop. Against. And myself, I will be four on this one, thank you. And Mr Tyler, could I have the numbers, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. So the total number of votes for the move was eight. The total number of votes against was three, and there was one abstention. So, so that, that move application is granted. Correct. Thank you. Thank you very much, members, and thank you to Councillor Edwards for her time. And we welcome Councillor Bartlett back into the fold for the next application. The next application being item 7C, which is 15 Vale Road in Pool. And this one is being dealt with by Mr Hodges. Mr Hodges. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Excellent. It looks like you're seeing that now, Chairman. So um, this is an application, a uh, household application at 15 Vale Road in Poole. Um, members, some of the members of the committee may remember dealing with an application at this site uh, back in the committee at July 2020, um, where a scheme was recommended for approval by officers and refused by members on the basis of its impact to uh, neighbouring properties. Um, so to members who are familiar with the site, on the uh, broader location. So this is Vale Road along here, and you have uh, to the right Branksome Station, uh, Redlands Retail Park over here, the Ashley Road through the middle of the site and Bournemouth Road uh, going off down the bottom. Um, one thing you'll see um, from the site photos and the street scene is a very reg regular pattern of development uh, with uh, properties all of a similar uh, size, design and uh, age. Uh, along the south side of Vale Road. Um, the, just showing you an aerial photo, you can see, get a clearer idea here of the uh, very regular pattern uh, of development in the area and the similarity in the design and appearance of these properties. Um, just 
Just a key thing to note from the street scene is the uh, the changes in levels, how the land is rising up um, as you go west, um, up Bell Road towards its junction with Alexandra Road. Um, so, Chairman, the, this is uh, following on from the dismiss scheme, and what we've got on the left-hand side was the uh, scheme which used uh, by the committee before, um, and the current scheme on the right-hand side. Um, as you'll see from the report, uh, the inspector was generally content uh, with the design aspects uh, of the scheme in terms of appearance and character of the area, um, and didn't object to this ground floor element here, which the majority of which I understand would be permitted development. And the key aspect was about this balcony um, uh, element on here. And the, uh, in, in response to uh, the dismissal of the scheme, you'll see currently this application, uh, the applicant has sought to significantly reduce that to this uh, hashed area on the uh, far right hand side. What that means in terms of elevations, so uh, on the top, a is the dismissed scheme, um, and uh, there was a much larger terrace pr proposed before with these steps down, um, and this uh, large, in effect, screen um, to defend the privacy from number 13, which is a property down the hill. Um, and the uh, inspector was concerned that that would be an overly dominant um, feature on the neighbour next door. And what you'll start to see when we look at a couple of the photos is the, uh, the difference in levels. Um, but also they were concerned that uh, due to the size and the arrangement here that there would be a significant loss of privacy to number 17 going up the hill um, from, uh, from views from the terrace up here. So in order to try and address that, the current scheme uh, much reduces that um, uh, screen along this, uh, uh, along this eastern side. Um, and restricting that area of balcony back and then with a privacy screen on the western side here. Um, in terms of the views from the front, um, these will be limited impact on the street scene are all set back. Most of the works are at the rear um, and the uh, inspector was satisfied with the impacts of the proposals on the character of the area. Uh, so this is the, you notice the scheme's uh, part retrospective. Um, this is ground floor element which has been built. And the key thing just to draw your attention to is how the gardens step up um, uh, to the rear as they go up the hill uh, to the south. So this does mean that depending on where you are in the gardens, you may be at the level um, of the uh, adjacent garden uh, as the properties rise up. Um, this is a couple of views taken actually from uh, the top of the flat roof. Um, so just on this right hand side, that's looking down the hill, uh, number 13. And so the uh, screen will be along here to defend um, any uh, limit any views into the neighbour from here. Um, and then on this side, uh, which would be on the western side, to screen the potential views over towards um, that property. Um, and then this is looking back up the hill, so to number 17. Um, again, you can see how the ground floor element is set very much down and then the gardens rise up. You see that quite steeply um, just in this part of the photo here. The gardens tend to be terraced as they go up um, and how then with a screen along this part of the extension here um, that will um, is intended to defend potential views and loss of privacy um, to the west going up the hill. And just finally, these are views from um, down in the neighbour at number 13. They have kitchen windows looking out onto the side element here. So what you can see, um, the, the white walls uh, in effect are the ground floor extension, uh, which is um, the element which is built um, and which the inspector was satisfied with. Um, and then the, the balcony in effect sits above the views from, from that property. Um, so, Chairman, um, we've taken due regard of the conclusions of the inspector in this case. Uh, the applicant sought to amend the scheme to do a scheme that, uh, in effect, seeks to address those concerns. And uh, we feel that's satisfactory done that in this particular instance, and we recommend the application to you for approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hodges. Mr Turner. Thank you, Chairman. So for this item, we have received um, no letters of objection, two letters of support 
and no board councillors speaking on this one. So starting with the first letter of support, this has um, been received Mr and Mrs Smalley, who are the applicants themselves, and their brief statement reads as follows. After the disappointment of the initial roof terrace plan being rejected, we have looked at how we can satisfy neighbours' concerns with the new application for the outdoor space for our new family home. The balcony will allow for light to pass into the kitchen of number 13, which we totally appreciate through the use of opaque glass, leaving both ourselves and our neighbour with full privacy. With respect to the privacy concern to our other neighbour at number 17, we have proposed a private balcony allowing privacy for all. We sincerely understand the concerns of our neighbours and have gone to lengths to find a satisfactory solution which allows for their concerns and allows for a small private outdoor space within our family home. And that is the end of the applicant's statement of support. The second statement of support is from Mr Giles Moyer of Chapman and Lilly Planning, who is the agent for this application, and his statement is as follows. This statement... Um, uh, this statement is provided on behalf of the applicants in support of their application for the erection of a rear and side extension to include the provision of a balcony. Mr and Mrs Smalley are very pleased to see that the officers have recommended the application for approval. As set out in the officers report, the application has been amended to reflect the concerns of the inspector, which led to the dismissal of the earlier appeal. The officers report acknowledges that these amendments have addressed the inspector's concerns. The application plan relates to a rear and side extension to include a small balcony on the rear extension. The side extension will consist of a 7.5 square meter utility area with separate access to the front and rear amenity spaces and the kitchen. Other than the two lantern lights, no other windows will be added to the side extension. The rear 13 square meter ground floor extension will accommodate a dining area and two lantern lights along the eastern side of the roof. The extension will also accommodate a 1.5 meter wide balcony on its roof. The balcony will be accessed from the southern bedroom and bordered by glazed balustrade. The balcony will be offset from the eastern wall of the property by one meter, which will provide space for the lantern lights. The balcony will have a width of 1.5 meters and consist of 1.6 meter high glazed balustrade along its western side, 1.1 meter high balustrade along the balcony's southern side and 1.8 metre high obscure glazed balustrade along its eastern side. The appeal decision establishes that the rear and side extension are acceptable and that the inspector's concerns were focused on the balcony, with the inspector quoting, the proposed extensions are part and parcel of the same development as the proposed terrace, and as such I cannot issue a split decision and approve only these parts of the proposed de development. The planning application in terms of the rear and side extensions are unchanged from the design which the inspector found to be acceptable. It is the balcony which has been reduced in size and re realigned to address the inspector's concerns. The scale of the balcony is smaller in comparison to the previous proposal, with a 1.5 metre width rather than the entire length of the rear extension. The obscure glass balustrade along the eastern side of the balcony will protect the privacy of number 13 Vale Road, and the private patio amenity space immediately outside the rear of the property. The applicants have taken full account of the inspector's concerns in the amended application and hope that the committee are able to support the officer's recommendation and approve the application. That's the end of the second statement, Chair. Thank you very much. Just turned it off, talking to myself. We have no other statements coming forward. Is there any members that would like to kick off the debate on this one, please? Councillor Farquhar. Thank you, Chair. It's um, just a question as regards how the procedure for this one um, works, because um, we heard that there isn't any uh, councillor representation, but in the planning pack, it actually says the reason for referral to the planning committee is referral by councillor O'Neill as it goes against policy PP27 loss of light. Um, have I lost something here in that the way that this actually works in that do the obscured uh, screens which are now proposed um, actually negate that uh, that um, referral, e.g. the loss of light? We will have to wait and see what Councillor O'Neill says when he decides to speak on it. He called the application in because he wasn't happy about it and he had a genuine planning reason for calling it in. That doesn't, of course, mean that he was predetermined on the fact that the, re the reason he gave is the fact that he was totally against it. So he is able to speak 
as long as he's always had an open mind as to the outcome of this, as long as he is not in his own mind predetermined that because of his thoughts on it going against the policy that he's totally against the application. And as long as he could be swayed by other members that he is wrong, then he can still take part and he will, as indicated, wish to speak on that in a moment. Understood, Chair. Yeah. So just for referral, when the uh, clerk actually said there was no representation from the councillor, there's nothing. No, the councillor hasn't put a representation and he's merely called this into the planning board because of his concern over a particular policy. Understood. Thank you very much for clarifying how, how it works. Thank you. Much obliged. And we will now go to Councillor O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, um, I mean, Councillor Falco, I was quite right. I did read part of this, uh, but I must be honest. I've looked at the revised plans. Uh, I remain open minded. And um, if, it, if the chairman accepts, I would rather retain any comments that I might make towards the end of the debate, having heard the full debate. Uh, and in the process of the debate, there may be one or two questions that I would wish to ask for clarity against the new proposal. Thank you. More than happy with that, Councillor O'Neill. You can come back with questions at any time, as you well know. Uh, Councillor Bartlett. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I do have a concern about the balcony. Um, it's been reduced in size hugely. But in mm. terms of protecting privacy for next door, what mm. you're actually doing by putting the screens in on either side of the balcony is protecting the privacy, but to a very limited degree to the properties on either side. But if you're standing on the balcony, looking at a slight angle, you effectively got a clear view over both the adjacent gardens. Now, the very often I hear people comparing that kind of view with the sort of view that you would get from a bedroom window. But of course, you've got to think about what the difference between the views from a window in a bedroom is to one that's from a balcony. The purpose of a window in a, in a bedroom is to give it light, the bedroom light and to give it air. Um, uh, but it's not primarily to, to seek a view, whereas a balcony is specifically designed in order for you to, to have an unobstructed view of something. That's what it's designed to do. Now, so, so what's the harm in that? Well, the harm is that this effectively, uh, you know, could have a number of people stood on a flat roof an elevated position looking into your back garden, which I think is a bit um, obtrusive, actually. And if it's there, it goes all the time. Uh, you know, if, if you, you want to have quite enjoyment of your own back garden, but people are actually looking down and into your back garden. I think that it does, does produce a degree of loss of privacy. And so, uh, although it's a small, a small balcony, it still does present that issue. And so, I, I would object to this uh, application purely on 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 the lack of privacy towards the adjoining properties. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pollock. Councillor Hilliard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question for Mr. Hodges, please. So, it, it's relating to the uh, inspectors the decision in appeal. So obviously it was about light, uh, so the loss of light. So going back, maybe choose which picture, but it, can you can you explain uh, how you think the, the reduced width now does not create that loss of life? The report says that the neighbours got a, a canopy over their kitchen uh, door or window. Now, obviously that that's their choice. They can remove that any time. Uh, but obviously a neighbour, a new build, they, they have no say of that. So if you could just cover that. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I'll have to come out of the um, presentation to actually look at the precise wording of the inspector's um, decision. But uh, actually, no, my understanding is it was an overbearing impact rather than a, particularly a loss of light to those side facing windows in the kitchen. So the, the nature of that screen um, on top, in effect, creating a, a sort of two storey flat roof bulk um, where there's a fairly narrowish gap between the two properties and side facing windows in number 13. Um, it's in effect a dominant rather than a, the light into that room. So it was that dominant aspect that, in effect, the applicant's trying to address this time by cutting that element back. So the extent of the sort of solid form close to the boundary is 
uh, mainly single story flat roof with a partial element that's um, higher, which is the screen above. So it's it's uh, it's an overbearing aspect rather than a light aspect. If you don't mind, could, could you go to the, the most appropriate picture so that we could just accept that? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so just to clarify, um, what you're seeing there, my understanding is this is the, the side elevation of the ground floor element. And what the inspector was concerned with is, is that by adding uh, the screen projecting out, uh, I'd guesstimate about three metres um, from the rear, would uh, provide additional overbearing impacts from looking out from those aspects. You're still going to see the ground floor element, clearly. Um, because of the proximity of the two, but that additional element on the top they felt was uh, harmful in terms of being overbearing. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Dunlop. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm Bartlett. Um, if you uh, look at the photos that the committee's been sent from the neighbour's point of view, shows you their areas immediately below where this balcony is going to be. Um, it's quite clear that anybody sat in there, sunbathing in there, will lose the privacy. When you come out onto a balcony, this particular one, you'll be overlooking both those neighbours directly. There's no real separation between the properties at all. There's not enough screening. It's, it's not as if, um, if there were the ability to actually plant some tall trees or screen it off. I think that would be um, a different different case. Um, I, I actually live in this area so I know how the land is and how it's quite difficult for the houses that are built around here on these slopes to get some degree of privacy but in this particular case I can't see how that would be obtained and I think it would be unacceptable for either of those neighbours to have somebody directly overlooking into their seating area right below. Uh, and for that reason, I, I couldn't support this application, Chairman. I understand, and I understand that. But what I do find frustrating on that is that none of the neighbours have objected. They, will, they will have the opportunity, but they haven't. Councillor Barnett. Just, just a, a reply, Chair. Um, they, they may not always live there, so the future residents' mm -hmm. position does have to be protected. True. Councillor O'Neill. No comment on that. Yeah, the uh, the neighbours both approached me uh, knowing that this was coming up today, um, and I did ask them if they'd uh, resubmitted. That uh, the assumption was that the because there's no change to their view, that that submission would carry forward. Um, so I don't think it was a deliberate intent. There is no indication that either party is going to move on from the property. Um, I have two questions, however, if I may. Um, the two questions are, do steps down from the roof of the terrace still remain as access to the garden as it did before? Because it did show steps down. Uh, and the other one is, with regards to the glazed screen to the side of the property uh, adjacent to number 13, how far is that screen removed from the edge? Ms. Dolgers? Um, thank you, Chair. Yes, so hopefully the, the top uh, plan answers that first question. The, the stairs are on the dismiss schema up here and uh, they're removed from this scheme. And just to, just to confirm that on the floor plan, that was a dismiss scheme, had the steps up from the garden and no steps up this time. And the steps you can see on the right, I understand, are pre-existing. Um, the and second issue about the extent to have stepped in, um, I I can either give you an estimate of that that about uh, half a metre, or I can if you give me a couple of minutes, I could probably measure it from the trapeze on the website, Chairman. And the other the other question, if we could go back to the picture uh, that was taken from number 13's kitchen. That's it. Um, yeah. The, this picture doesn't really show the truth. I've actually been in the kitchen and stood outside. I mean, kind of virtually touch wall to wall. Um, but actually, if you look at that picture, that kitchen window is about 14 to 15 feet back from the rear of this lady's property. It is her main kitchen window. The extension 
which is quite high relative to her property, is beyond the back of her property. So she is really enclosed within her kitchen space. Um, and it's those sort of things that really are not showing on here. The other thing is because of the scale of the uh, approved extension, as the sun moves across uh, from uh, east to west, or the shading is now quite significant during certain times of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Any comments, Mr. Hodges? No, nothing to add, Okay, thank you. Let's remembers at this time. No? Councillor Larry Neal. Uh, I mean, could I, yeah, if I could, if I could summarise my thoughts on this, and, uh, you know, I was, I, I came here today willing to be persuaded. Um, I must admit that this so named revised scheme does little uh, to persuade me. Uh, other than to confirm my original fears. The statement about other properties is misleading and does not support my observation re really those others who have their outside seating areas not unsurprisingly directly to the rear of their properties and at ground floor level. Um, my observation would be when you stand in the applicant's rear garden, you can see other properties' terraced areas, but these are not used as the main seating area. And that's no great surprise because the seating areas that are used are at ground floor level to the house. I do believe that my original comments still remain, they being that as was previously stated, the kitchen at number 13, which is constantly in use by its elderly resident owner, is on the right hand corner and to the rear of her home. And the owner's main kitchen window is some 14 to 15 feet from the rear of her property. It is in my, in my opinion, already compromised before the addition of a screen. I conclude that the already built extension which was approved at floor number 15, has obscured her view quite significantly and has therefore affected the right to light, which I believe that she should have. And permitting an opaque screen uh, to further endanger that right is totally, to my mind, the wrong decision. It is not, is, it is not best advised. Um, both, both properties either side will suffer degrees of overlooking and the elderly resident number 13 will suffer a, few, a further loss of light into her kitchen, which she uses constantly. Um, so I'm not persuaded. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor O'Neill. We seem to be at a bit of an impasse here. Is there anyone willing to make a move on this at this moment? Or would you like further information? Um, I don't want to make a move, but I think this debate is throwing up that this would be, would have been or maybe still could be a case for having a site visit yep mr hodges um thank you chairman i think hopefully there's enough information within uh the photographs uh that you can see those relationships and make a judgment on that um your judgment may be different to our uh, mm. uh in in respect of the acceptability of the scheme and the impact on neighbours living conditions and privacy and the only I think the only comment I just would like to say um, in terms of just going to the space of this balcony um, you'll see that it, it's pretty limited um, and the only other comment I would do in, in to help you with your deliberations is that um, any views that start to get funneled by the privacy screens and that's the purpose of the privacy screens to protect those immediately uh, surrounding rear areas so that um, anyone sat up there their views are in effect sort of funneled out like that in effect in a 45 degree angle so the, the purpose of the privacy screens is in effect to protect those immediate areas to the rear of the properties um, and so that any views would be uh, looking towards the rear of those gardens where the land is higher up chair yeah, hope that helps <laughs> Any further points on this one? I, I must admit, when I went round to see it the first time, I was like totally against it. I think we all were when we first dealt with this one a long time ago. When I've been back and looked at it again, I'm not as concerned as I was then. I think um, I think there will still be a proportion of harm to the neighbours, but I'm not as sure that it was would time and I think 
that made his points and the applicants have tried to amend the points that the inspector has made on this and I think they've done probably as good a job as what they would do and, and I feel that if we were to refuse this again the inspector would probably go against us and I am going to make a very unbalanced judgment and I'm going to propose that we go with the officer's recommendation. It's it's difficult when I'm batting my head, I, even when I was a, as I'm speaking to you now, part of me is saying go yes, part of me is saying no, but I think as an unbalance and having listened to everyone and taking your views carefully into consideration, I think I'm still very slightly minded on balance to go with the officer's recommendation on this one. So I will, and I will look for a seconder for that move. Councillor O'Neill. Yeah. If I may, Chair, I'd just like to comment uh, on your comments, which I do understand and respect. But if the original proposal causes harm, and on balance, the second proposal causes loss, less harm, isn't it not still harmful? I think you're, you're absolutely right, but I think we have to take a view on what is acceptable harm, what is not acceptable harm. And it's a very, very fine line, and it's one that we as a planning committee have to accept our responsibilities on. And it's difficult, and I'm going to put my head on the line on this one and say that I would accept it. And as chairman of the planning board, I think that's what my, my job is to do. My job is to balance up the views of all of you here, and I've listened very carefully to what you've all said. I've read the reports very carefully. I've listened to Mr. Hodges and my on balance view is that this is just about acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We will do in a second. Councillor Johnson. Thank you, Chairman. Like you, I've also had a lot of consternation about this particular application. Um, like yourself, I was steadfastly against the original proposal that had the, the very large screen. It was you know, it effectively created a second, second floor or first floor even um, out to the rear of the property. With this one, I think that the size of the balcony, just how small it is, greatly assuaged some of my fears about the levels of overlooking. If this was one where someone could uh, or, or two people could comfortably sit out there and engage in activities, then I would be um, against it, I think. But the fact that it is it is small, it is there, there is space for maybe a chair, um, to sit there, I think just about tips it over into acceptable. I also think that the fact that as it stands, you could just stand anywhere on the on the extension and look into the the surrounding properties also means that I'm if I would be in favour of there being a balcony to restrict a person's movement on that extension and to prevent anyone standing right on the corner, literally over the fence of the neighbouring property. I also think some of my fears about the overlooking are assuaged by the fact that the way the gardens rise up, if someone was intent on overlooking, they can go and stand at the other end of the garden and have arguably a much, much better view. So like yourself, I think on balance, this is just about acceptable and I would second your move and support it. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. I, I think you've actually hit the nail on the head because I think having the screens there is probably the only way that I would have allowed it. If they were not going to be putting screens on there, I think I'd be totally against it because I think you're right. You could stand much closer to the edges and get a much better view if there weren't screens there to actually prevent you from seeing further things. So with that said, I will go to the vote on this and I will call your names as per the list. Councillor Johnson. Four. Councillor Barron. Against. Councillor Bartlett. Against. Councillor Bull. Against. Councillor Davies. For. Councillor Borthwick. Yes. Against, and I would like my uh, name recorded for the minutes, please. Councillor Hall. Against. Councillor Hilliard. Against. Councillor Lepedevin. Against. Councillor O'Neill. Against. Councillor Dunlop. Against. That being the case, why the hell didn't one of you make a move to refuse? <laughs> well, why have you not got the courage of your own convictions to make a decision? Sure. Well, you jumped in rather quickly. No, you were given the ample opportunity for somebody to make a move and nobody did. And you all stand there and object to it. I find that strange. 
comes to the meeting, is it? I think that we could have made a proposal to you for this particular thing. So are you proposing a visit then, Councillor Borthwick? Consider, no. But the, the application is a worthy thing, but not understanding it fully, I think the only thing you can solve this matter is by actually seeing it on site. Can I ask you if you actually went to visit the property, Councillor Borthwick? I have no time, have I? You've got the papers this morning. Councillor Bartlett. Rebuke accepted, Chair. Thank and you. I would now like to propose to uh, refuse this application. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Secondly, Councillor Hall will go through the procedure again. Could I have your reasons for refusal, please? Loss of privacy, but I'm afraid I can't tell you the policy <laughs> number exactly, and I'd have to refer to Planning Officer for his expertise on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, the policy is, is going to be PP27 in the pool local plan. So um, uh, let me just find it. Um, here we go. So policy PP27 1C uh, development will be permitted provided that it's compatible with surrounding areas not, and would not result in a harmful impact on amenity for local and future occupiers. So considering levels of daylight, sunlight, and privacy, noise, and vibration. So um, just to be clear, clear uh, it's a privacy issue, no no other additional reasons. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, so a loss of privacy to neighbouring properties. Thank you very much. So we'll go through the process again. Is there anyone wants to speak Sorry. before I go to the vote? Chairman, if I may, uh, I think the loss of light is relevant as well. As the sun transitions through the day, it is quite significant. Thank you. Councillor Dunlop? Chair, can I... Um, I just want to caution the committee against a loss of light reason mm -hmm. for refusal, just because that's something that can be quantified and measured um, and is quite a stiff test to actually prove an unacceptable loss of light from a development. Much easier for to argue an overbearing impact, which is what the inspector dismissed it on. Um, that's a matter of uh, professional assessment and judgment. Um, but you can actually quantify and measure the amount of light that that um, kitchen area will get in. And I'm just cautious that the inspector felt that aspect was acceptable last time. And so as we are doing a lesser scheme this time, um, I foresee that we would run into problems at appeal if we run an argument that the inspector previously found acceptable uh, on a lesser scheme. So I just caution against that yep. aspect. Accept to Councillor O'Neill. Yeah, I accept that. I think that's yep. good advice. Thank you, Chair. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Dunlop. Sorry, Chairman, you were looked asked about reasons for refusal. I was just checking something. Um, it, it was, um, I think the only thing I want to say was, um, are we absolutely sure that is that the maximum privacy screening that, that, that we can put in place, my concern still remains that it's um, overlooking and it's a loss of privacy. Um, if you would prefer, I'm also happy to make a move against if you prefer to do it that way no it's been made now the move move has been made so we're we're on but track. you've had the vote on that no not yet no no we're just about to have a move against the recommendation ah, okay so are we all set all ready sure okay we will begin councillor johnson against councillor baron for councillor bartlett for Councillor Bull. For Councillor Davies. Against. Uh, Councillor Borthwick. Councillor Farquhar. For Councillor Hall. For Councillor Hilliard. For Councillor Lepedevin. For Councillor O'Neill. For and Councillor Dunlop. For and I also would be against. Could we have the numbers, please, Mr. John Tyler? You can indeed, Chairman. So the total number of votes for was nine. The total number of votes against was three. And there was one abstention, Chair. Thank so you. therefore, that motion to refuse is carried. So this application is refused. Thank you to everyone for that. A good debate. And with that in mind, I call the meeting to an end. But I would ask you all to remain. But we'll have a quick comfort break for everyone because I didn't call one earlier. So apologies for that. So quick five minute comfort break. And then we need a quick chat on the protocols going forward. So could we stop there?